I tried to get as much of uh, your background as I could with regards to your career because there's only a handful of things that I personally was able to come across here, uh, apart from the Shogun Productions that you've done so far. And um, the two because films- Because they're, they're not really worth talking about. <laughs> well, well, you know, I'll say, look here, here's what I'll say. I, I will say this here, and I, and I hope you don't mind me delving into this here because there was actually one film that I was actually quite surprised that I came across on Tubi of all places, believe it or not. And it was a short film that you had done uh, called Faithless. And oh, right. uh, so so what I, so what, what I did was, because the search engine for, for a lot of these um, streaming platforms, even in general, I guess, depending on who you're looking for, doesn't always populate with the person you're looking for, despite the fact they're in the credits, such as yourself. Yeah. So when I did do research uh, as far as uh, film, your filmography is concerned, specifically on Tubi. So for example, I put in your name, and only one film came up, and that was Faithless. Yeah. And it, of course, I know you're in, well, obviously you're in uh, Nemesis and, and Renegades, but mm -hmm. for some reason that never populated, even though you are oh, in right. the movies, and even though yeah. they are on the p platform. But when I looked up, uh, when I came across your name and saw Faithless, and then I saw the movie, the reason why I found that one to be interesting for me personally is because apart from those two films that I came across with your with Shokun Productions, this was the most different out of all the things you've done that I've come across here so far with your yeah. acting. Yeah. And so I was actually quite surprised, but at the same time, I was actually really curious with, because, uh, you know, Shogun is mainly dealing with genre films, but I was actually wondering, like, uh, if you would ever be given that same opportunity again with that kind of dramatic turn mm -hmm. somewhere along the lines with Shogun uh, Productions, if you will. So... From what I had seen, what you have done with the short period of time you had in that film, I actually liked what I came across there at that at that yeah. point. Yeah, yes. Um, so I was hoping that you can kind of delve into that as well because there's there's a bit of a, you know, I've I've seen some of the reels that you have available on YouTube, but I couldn't find majority of those films uh, online at mm. all anywhere, mm. with the exception of those two, oh, with exception of Faithless and Aura, which is the other film that I mm. also have come across as well. All oh, right, yes. So. And watching those two films, apart from Nemesis and um, and Renegades, you know, you've talked before in the past about you know what kind of got you into acting and whatnot. But I wanted to actually get your your experiences with regards to everything leading up to Shogun after you've had those productions uh, completed prior to what you guys are doing right now. And I wanted to know if if by any chance if you had felt like if you had seen the films. Um, what you felt like your performances was like at that point, and if you feel like you've gotten better as a result of that, and with the opportunities that are being presented, because Shogun is obviously becoming much more of a household name. And speaking with Jonathan recently, he kind of delved into a lot of the the, the details about upcoming yeah. projects and whatnot, which I'm very excited for for all of you guys involved with this. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, like, if you have have had a chance to look back at about the things you have done before and what you guys are leading, uh, what you guys are expecting to coming down the pipeline here and how you feel about yourself with regards to your acting capabilities coming off of those two previous productions I've mentioned before, before getting into all this stuff here for yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I started when you were talking about those short films, I think I was doing a lot more theater then. Right. Um, so I started off doing theater and then I did some, I sort of, led into some short films I did loads of student films and just wanted to be in front of the the camera really um uh so I started off doing uh just short films that were in interesting to me right. and I I always really liked cop shows and right. you know the, the sort of the NYPD type things right. um so that's why I think that was a sort of a different thing for me playing that sort of detective role um, I really enjoyed doing that because I liked putting the suit on and sort of no makeup, quite raw. It right. was shot quite raw as well. Um, and I then, yeah, I just sort of led into doing things that, I don't know, I think because I was a bit more serious um, and I didn't really, if you would have said to me, you know, what's your favourite genre? I think for me, I, I quite like the psychological sort of, thriller type right. things to do um but at the moment um i'm doing lots of different roles um and i'm really loving that i'm loving to have the experience to try to to choose different roles that i i think that you know when i did nemesis that was written for me right. um by adam stephen kelly and he kind of played to what he thought 
you know, what he thought I could do. Um, so, so that was very different, you know, to do something like that and quite sort of courageous in a way as well. Um, so that was that. So compared to what I'd done before, yeah, that was completely different. And then with when you were saying, do you not think? Or Well, I mean, I think because what I'm thinking right now with you when it comes to the what I've came across with you, your work so far is like, Faithless to me is the one that stuck out the most, like I said before, because that's something that was new to me that I'd seen from what I've seen previously before. And I'm hoping that when I'm saying this here, it doesn't indicate by any means that I'm saying that what you had done in Nemesis or Renegades or anything else that I've come across here, that you weren't good. That's not what I'm implying by any means. What I, what what I, The reason why I found that to be interesting with Faithless is because you mentioned before the, the no makeup, the rawness with the with the mm -hmm. performance and the 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 the, uh, the situation that the characters are going through, especially the the gravity behind all, all of it. Um, I always I remember if, uh, I felt like that this is what I think you're at your best. I'm not not mm -hmm. playing a, like a I'm not saying your character was Dasa by any means, but something about that understanding the gravity and that balance that your I think that your character was bringing, even though eventually the you know your partner ended up doing what he ended up doing at the end of the film. But I always felt like that was something that I felt like if we saw more of that, there's so much more I think people can 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 get from you from you. And, and again, I'm hoping that when I'm saying that, like I said before, it does not imply that you are that you are not good in any in the previous ones I mentioned before. It's just that that stuck out to me the most. And I always thought like this is where her bread and butter is at, at least in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean that's and that's the reason why I was asking before about when you're coming off of that. You know, how do you feel like? Because, like, if if I if I was in your shoes, and I had saw myself in that excuse me in that role, I would be like, I've actually gotten pretty good at this stuff. I know I can do better at that point. Yeah. So, like, I I I always I'm always curious about how someone comes off a project, how they view themselves, because a lot of actors like that I've come across, and most of them have always said that um you know they don't really too they're not too keen on checking their work out for one reason or another. That's the most common you know trend that I hear, and then. But I'm wondering, like, but you, I've seen your performances. It's so good. I'm not saying that you should look back and say, I'm good at that. But it's just more like you should look at it and study it because there's something you've done there that I imagine if you carry this over elsewhere, whatever genre that may be, you can excel in, in whatever field that, you know, whatever particular film you're going to work on. And some don't do it and they're, they're, they are just as good, if not better, despite, you know, my, you yeah. know, my, my perception of it. So, I mean, I don't mean to ramble on, but that's essentially my, my perspective on you on that because. When I saw, like I said, it's a small role, but that's the one that had the most impact on me as far as your yes. performance is concerned. Mm -hmm. And then even some of the reels that I came across as well, too. I forgot which one it was at the name of the film, but I think you were, there was a, it was at an auditorium where, again, you, 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 you were like, I, I believe you were like a social worker, if I remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, um, that, 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 that film was, um, directed by, I was the only, person in that film who didn't speak Indian because I'm I'm not Indian that's why but right. because of my coloring I got the role <laughs> so I was actually playing a um a, a teacher um who it was an, actually an Indian film and okay. um it went over to India and did quite well over there actually it's called Pada which is okay. Vail in, in in Indian okay. and um, yeah that that was um an interesting film I, I really did enjoy that and yes I did play a a teacher who the the abused um, girl comes to and I and I help okay. and yeah that that was a, a lot more raw as well and right. I, I think um, I think it's you know the the different scripts as well you know that they're, they're so different right. um, you know I think comparing that to um, a role where I'm meant to be a gangster's um, wife actually. Right. Uh, a children trafficking husband and um you know i actually like that part of the of the film that, that yeah was, I, mean, I think that was pretty where good the film actually. where we were all bad in it there were no yeah. good people in yeah. um it's, it's very difficult to sort of i i totally understand where you're coming from with yeah. the, the rawness and the um the different but i i think that it's um the films are so different to compare do you right. know what i mean yeah, yeah i know what you're saying um, yeah so okay. it's um it's, I guess, I don't know, you know, if we did it again, if you'd play it differently, I think it's a, it's, it's really great looking back on hindsight as an actress right. as well and seeing, yeah, you know, maybe I could have played it like that, but I guess it depends on your director as well. Um, you know, 
it really does um, help if the director is, you know, good at, at you know what he does and um, brings out certain things in you too. Um, you know, as an as an actor or an actress, I think you can bring it, but who really makes it work? I think as a director, um, and you know, it depends who is directing. I think. Do you have any say in the matter? right now with Shogun, when it comes to what exactly you want to do. Uh, and what I mean by that is this, is like, so if someone like it, for Nemesis, for example, the, the script was written for you, uh, considering what you could do for the character. Mm -hmm. But moving forward from all that, uh, with regards to the upcoming productions, the ones that you're, that you're, you're still working in now, the ones you've already completed, um, do you have any say in the matter as far as like the direction you want to take the character and how that would impact the story? Like, so for example, if the writer and director wrote a character, your character a certain way, and you say, well, I like this, but I want to change X, Y, and Z instead. Could yes. you fit it to my, yeah. my liking? You can do that. Yes. Okay. I mean, Sh Shogun is very good at that. I mean, look, Jonathan is not only is he the producer, he sort of really knows what he wants from a film. He'll, right. he'll write a synopsis and say, right, this should be a film. This would, you know, he, he really is a very creative person in, in all different ways. Um, and he really does have great visions of how he wants a film. And, you know, what we've done with Shogun is we've always um, let the actors read the scripts. They they go away and they say, well, actually, I wouldn't say that. You know, that doesn't really feel natural for me to do that. And mm. it's always been rewritten or something has to be rewritten and rewritten. We're, we're getting better at that. You know, when we first started, okay, you know, the first couple of films that we did, uh, you know, they're, they're the first two that we, to kick it all off. Yeah. But really for me, the first proper Shogun film, proper, I mean, you know, the proper one out of lockdown and all of that bullshit um, <laughs> was, uh, was uh, Peter Rabbit. So for me, um, I think that, from from Peter Rabbit, which is this crazy slasher movie that we um, shot last year, I think that that really kicks off. I think the way Shogun want to be looked at. I think, and um, and when you were saying about the different roles, um, yes, the roles that I'm playing, I'm in the upcoming movies. I'm playing a psychiatrist. Um, I'm playing a doctor. I'm playing an MI5 scientist nerd. So you'll see a, a, a completely different side of me um, this year. Right. <laughs> um, you know, when we shot Nightfall, um, the hardest part for me of that movie was, um, because I'm absolutely terrible with science, um, were, was learning the script, all the words and the, you know, the different potions and everything. <laughs> whatever they call, um, you know, trying to get that out was very, um, you know, challenging, I, I guess. But, um, but you know, you know, when you're working with someone like Jeffrey Moore, come on, it's, uh, it's, it was an absolute pleasure. There, you know, this, for some reason, this reminded me of something that when you had said this year about the the challenges, but because um, I, I did this with Devony, but I'm, I'm doing this with you now. I had um, heard an interview that you had done uh, in in the at the premiere for renegades mm -hmm. and you were speaking with somebody about you know the, the synopsis of the film the 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 yeah. journey and whatever else and then you had mentioned before you know the uh, the, the lockdown was also occurring at during that period as well too but you did something that actually caught me by surprise that i was wondering like you know if you would ever do that because you did i think you did it once before from a reel that i came across that you had done for a movie you had done i think where you had played like a more or less like a southern bell and the interview I'm referring to, you had play, you you were basically talking about Lee Majors, and you put on an American accent, and I was like, uh, and I thought to myself, I mean, it was hard for me to hear because there was a lot of noise in the background, so it was very difficult for me to hear the the more or less the accuracy behind it. But from what I could gather, is you know the the fact you're able to just put it on the spot. Um, I thought that it, that was, it, it, it did actually help that I had lots of tequila in me on that interview. <laughs> I, when I saw that on YouTube, I, I was like, oh, please, no, I'm so drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even tell them for that matter, but oh, thank it was actually pretty good, though, So, if, if, from what I remember about, about that interview. But but that's one of the things that I, I was wondering, like, you know, when it comes to, you talk about challenges, you talked about, and that's the reason why I remembered it, because you talked about the the words for scientists and how they had to use all these different various things to to kind of get the point across. Uh, you know, I to me, it kind of struck me as a person that 
is willing to take on a challenge despite how difficult it may be. But but I'm curious about those next level challenges where the reason I'm saying this to you is because like um, if you have say in the matter, would you would you ever consider taking on a challenge that would step up your game, if you will, in this case, like an accent where you would definitely play put in, play a character to your liking, but now you have to put on some to, some sort of accent to more or less fit the character's background, if you will. And I ask that because, you know, Shogun, I, I mean, sorry, uh, Jonathan was telling me that he's basically making films for everybody that everyone can watch no matter, you know, no matter where part of the world you're from. But then I'm, when I hear you say, when I hear the that one reel uh, where you're putting on like a Southern accent, and then I hear you in the interview where you put on an American accent, uh, more or less, um, I th I'm thinking to myself, then there's, I'm sure there's a lot more opportunities for you as an actress that could be able to do something that can just broaden your horizons, if you will. But you ever consider yeah. doing something like that for yourself to consider yes. to stepping it up? Yes, definitely. And um, in the future, there is one where I um, have an American accent. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's, an, it's a Western. Okay. Um, set in the sort of gold rush era. So it's a sort of period, um, period horror Western. <laughs> is it is it easy for you to put on an accent or is you have to work on it uh, to kind of get to that um, that lingo if you will I think the American accent is really difficult um actually I think it's much easier to do a southern accent because I don't know why for English people it, it the drawl is is very yeah. easy to, to get out but um I yeah I do find the American accent quite hard actually I can do any other accent but the American one is um you know it's very easy South African and Australian and you know all those sorts of accents for English people to do right. um but I think to, to get it just right, um, it it really does need a lot of work. Mm. Um, so I'd definitely be working with somebody for that because I, you know. What's the easy accent, easiest accent for you to do apart from your very own accent? But like, what's the one that you can do by the drop of a hat for yourself? Um, probably South African or Australian or. Really? Uh, yeah. Interesting. Think, yeah. Mm. That's very interesting. So when now with the way our things are going for you right now with regards to your career, Shogun, um, do you see, do you, do you feel more optimistic about how you know, the way things started for you beforehand, you know, with Shogun, the trouble mm -hmm. production you had, are you seeing a little bit more of a, an optimism behind with what's going on? Cause Jonathan, I mean, the way he, I'm excited for you guys, but the way he described it, there's like a, a long list of projects you oh, guys are working and on. We, yeah. And we, we, it's yeah. piling up from what I'm understanding. It really but, is. I mean, basically if there were about 48 hours in a day, <laughs> and we could have 15 months in the year we would just be just that would be just enough time so we we have a lot going on i mean we've got coming out this year we've got peter rabbit mm. we've got halloween which is an amazing um yeah. and that's that's i'm really excited for everybody to see that one i don't know have you seen it i've only seen the the trailer that um that jonathan sent out to me before him and i spoke right. Uh, and I was telling him in the email and also in the conversation that I had a huge smile on my face when I saw that. And then when he told me in the conversation that there's talks about putting toys together, as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, there's yeah. a lot of high hopes for this movie. They're, and they're got really me very excited. Yeah, it, it really is exciting because we do actually have a couple of, um, you know, miniature, what are they called again? Sorry, it just slipped my mind. Like little miniature but, figures of the... Yeah, of the... Like, like this one. This is my... Dog Danny. <laughs> oh, okay, but, okay. I see what you're no, saying. No, but it's um, yeah, like that. But it's um, it's one of the the clown and, and actually one of me. Thank you very much. Um, oh, really? Ellen, Ellen Marks, the Doctor. Yes. Um, oh. I think it's because um, I'm quite, I am quite different in this. I don't have makeup on in this one either, <laughs> so I'm I'm sort of quite raw in this one too. And it's it's um, yeah, I'm I'm so excited for you to see this one coming out this year. Then we go straight on to Nightfall, which we're filming at the minute. Right. Um, we've already shot half of it, and we're shooting the next half imminently. Um, Nightfall, then Werewolf Hunt, right. straight on to Werewolf Hunt, um, which is another fantastic one. Right. Um, and then Harbinger, and then um, beginning of the year, um, I'm going to be doing Midnight Kiss, which is a... A uh, sort of sexy vampire film, so that will be my sort of sexy film for the year. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. when you guys are like, when when you're looking at the schedule right now, does it get a little bit overwhelming? This, I mean, like in the beginning, yes. you know, it was it's it's kind of a, a slow start, you know, mm. especially during the pandemic, and that in itself was overwhelming. But considering that 
I'm not going to say it's it's easier because because it, COVID's kind of died down, but but considering the amount of uh, accessibility you guys have now, um, does that kind of do you guys take that in account for the amount of work that you guys have have coming up ahead where you're able to kind of just figure out what's I guess what I'm asking here is more like about like what's in your eyes what's more of a priority for you the the the, the amount of work that you guys have or or is it more in a sense of uh, do you have a perspective of what is the overall process that, that each projects are going to are going to be bringing that will make it, it you know just as exciting or challenging or whatever that those reasons may be, and the reason I'm asking that is because because there's an onslaught of production you guys are working on right now. Um, Sometimes I always wonder if if the people involved with it do they have a little moment of time where they realize this is way too much for me to do right now. But considering how you guys started and where you guys are ending up right now, I'm wondering if your perspective has changed a little bit how you look at certain things, considering the amount of work that's that's piling up ahead of you guys. Yeah, I mean, look with the volume of films, they're always, they're, they're never always going to be to a certain standard, right. and I think that depending on budget, depending on. Um, you know, the script, the genre. I think they're always going to be, like, if you do five movies, there are going to be, like, sort of three really good ones and two that, you know, <laughs> are good films. But, you know, maybe, you know, we, we know what we make. They're not the best, but not the best. <laughs> but you know what I mean when you're, like, you mean, tweaking right. yourself. You're like, okay. But, you know, look, <laughs> we, we have to keep keep making them. You know, there's no mm. point... You know, people talk about making a movie and you can sit there talking in bars and pubs and with your friends. Oh, we're making a movie, making a movie. But who's going to see it? You know, I've done loads of these films back in the days where, you know, everyone's talking about a movie and no one actually gets their asses into gear to actually get it done and get it out there, get a distributor, get get it seen, you know. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is just, you know, get it going. Let's Let's get some films going. Let's try and do, you know, seven to eight a year and um, get them out there. Let people see that Shogun logo and go, yeah, this is going to be a good film. You know, are you confident though? Like, yeah, are you confident though with how things are going to look out for you guys in the long term with regards to the, the amount of work you guys are doing? Because, uh, like I said, because the the workload is is piling up here. So, I, I guess what I was trying to to uh, to to more or less refine the question again. It, I think what I was just trying to really uh, pinpoint is the fact that there's so much going on that. You know, obviously, it sounds like to me Jonathan does have a, a pretty good head on as far as like what's what's the most important task at hand for him to focus on. You know, what the priority would be. But I'm wondering, like, if you guys are looking at it in a sense of like, um, you know, if because right now you have Nightfall and you had a break and you're going to follow up with the, the production again, and then right after that you have another production coming up here. So it's like one yeah. after the other. So with each set of work that you guys are doing here, everyone being involved, especially Jonathan overseeing everything, mm. does it does it become like a? I mean, do you guys have to find a way to be able to take a step back, refresh yourself, and then get back at it again? Because if it's one after the other, I I just wonder like does the, does the process still work the same? Where since there's so much going on that you know, do you need it? Do you have to have a refresher before you get onto the next bit? For, so that way, well, I mean, it doesn't yeah, like, I mean, get dwindled you, in the you, process. You do and you don't. Look, you know, this, the thing about it, it's called the movie business. Right. You know, it's a business. Right. And, you know, people don't just have holidays all the time and don't, you know, there, there are some, uh, you know, people who work many, many hours a day and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. I mean, why shouldn't the film business be the same, the same? You know, it's not all about, oh, let's take a break because we've had filming and let's reboot and everything. No, we just got to get up. We could just get on with it. You know, we we have a super busy life. Jonathan's always in either meetings, on Zoom. We're just lucky we have an office here in our house and we live together. We're married, thank God, because we spend so much time together. And, you know, we have to because if he did a job like this and I didn't do what I did, I would never see him and vice versa, really, with what we're doing. Um, but more so him, obviously. Um, and we have a family. You know, we've got children. We have a dog that needs walking three times a day. And um, and I've got a house to run to. Um, you know, there's, there's four children. There's, you know, there's, um, there's, there's a lot going on. And, you know, you can wear many hats and make it all work together. You know, we have 24 hours a day. 
I sleep for four hours a day every night. That's how I. That's how m- many hours I sleep. I know it's crazy, isn't it? All my girlfriends think I'm absolutely mad, but I, I, I have one of these Fitbit things on that, you know, do all your heart rate because I was so nervous that I was not getting much sleep. But it seems to work, and um, you know, we like I'm doing this Zoom with you now. I mean, it's for me, it's twenty past ten at night. Um, so it's you know there's all different hours that we have to do and it's fine you know it's that's what you have to do it's um i think you know things happen when you're busy right you know i think when there's these down times and you sloping off there's too much time to you know we we really put a lot of time into the pre-production it's all done all of our pre-production is done we we recce things we we're always driving around trying to find things jonathan's on zooms all day long and meetings and um you know getting things together so just when we're filming we do our filming and it's works really well really well we have a great team now and we've been sort of curating um uh you know the dops and the stills photographers and makeup and you know just a little selection of directors writers and you know i think we've really got a good team now um and you know they they want to work too you know um it's great do you do you think about the future for yourself because i asked this to jonathan too recently about you know like how because obviously you guys both have to with regards to the production but i'm talking about more in a sense for yourself Hmm. about the the long-term you know goals you guys have uh, do you do you think about you know what could be what what you guys are looking for what you guys are expecting I mean do you have a little bit of that for yourself looking ahead of that Oh yes sure okay. um, Well I'd I'd love it that you know when the Shogun logo comes up I I would just love people to go Oh yeah great we'll watch it it's a Shogun film <laughs> That's what I would love um, And I think we will definitely get there with the different genres that we have coming out and all the different scripts with the the crews and the writers and all the directors we have on board it's really i mean the, the next three years for me I, i'm so super excited for i really am um and sort of i'm getting a bit sort of my palpitations to kind of talking about it but i really super am excited for that um i'm really excited for people to see me in a different light too mm. um and to see what i have to offer as well it's it's difficult you know um it's we're sort of of the age where um you know, at my age or whatever, people, you know, they, they want to see young people on the screen. It's hard. I, I know how many years I've got left and what I what I have got in my future planned. Um, and um, that's exciting too. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to direct. That's what I've always, you know, had in the back of my mind. And um, I have think... Have you tried that before, directing anything in, in, in your past? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't um, tried directing, um, but there's always a first one. And um, I've I've got a lot of um, experience. You know, look, I produced Peter Rabbit too, right. and um, so I, ha- I have a lot of um, input on. You know, after this, I'm watching the latest cut of Halloween, and we, you know, we make notes. We go back. We, you know, it goes to edit. I, I have a lot of input in seeing how the films are put together and um, working with the directors as well. Um, And I think that I could, I definitely think I would like to have the opportunity to do that. Um, And also, you know, give opportunity to, um, you know, lots of different people as well to act. You know, I'm I'm curious because with with you about how you're talking about looking into producing, I mean, so you produce and you're looking at directing. Um, when you when you're working on the production um do you consider yourself uh, someone that that's approachable someone that's uh i would say are you difficult is basically what i'm trying to get here are you, do you think you're a difficult person to work with and uh-huh. and if you think so why and if you don't i would also like to know why too okay um I, I don't know who would sit here and say, oh, yes, I'm such a difficult person oh, <laughs> to work for, but but no, um, or to work with. Um, <laughs> I I mean, on Peter Rabbit, I did all the catering as well. Um, okay. That was vegan, vegetarian, um, and 
everybody else. Um, I did, I was making teas and coffees for everybody. I, I had a small role in the film. I didn't have a very big role. Right, you um, had a cameo, from what I understand. I did, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a couple of scenes. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I actually thought that some of the uh, the younger people there thought I was actually catering. So that was quite funny when I had to say to them, well, actually, um, I am actually part of Shogun Farm. So they were like, what? <laughs> but um, that that was quite funny. But I, I quite like that. You know, that's really good because you get to see how people treat you, actually. Right. Which is quite nice. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I look, Shogun is our, our bread and butter and it's our business. Mm. And my strengths are that, um, that I can help do those sorts of things. Look, I have four children. I, I can cook for... 60 people like that if i need to it's it's just one of those things you know with right. children's friends and things yeah. like that and throwing things together that's that's absolutely fine um i've always dealt with a big busy household so it's kind of the same on a film set you know um <laughs> it's um and and jonathan does all the really really important stuff so it, it really <laughs> does work but actually if you ask people when they're hungry what is important i think that it's um Sometimes at two o'clock in the morning on, you know, when it was pissing it down with rain and, you know, a nice cup of tea goes a long way, especially in England, you know, we drink a lot right. of tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, how do you, how do you deal with like balancing out uh, for yourself with regards to the amount of work that you do, you know, uh, making time for the family? You know, you, mm. So like, how do you, wh what do you guys, where do you find the balance to kind of not overwhelm yourself with, uh, with work and then have it affect uh, everything else that you do? Oh, well, what we do is I go to the gym. That's the one thing I actually have to do most mm. days. Um, just for my just for me, my headspace, my strength, my, you know, everything. So I, I always prioritize that. Um we walk the dog and Jonathan and myself try to do as much as we can together. I mean, obviously sometimes it's not possible for him. He's he's very, very busy. Right. Um but the children, you know, they're older now. I mean, one lives in China, who works over there now, and um, he's the eldest one at 23. And then one's second year university, and the next one's going to university, and so we'll only have one left at home who's 12. Um, but we have always, I mean, I've always really prioritised the children and my family right. and Jonathan. You know, Jonathan, the children and the dog are really the number one, you know. Right. We, really couldn't do anything if we didn't have our little family right. it would be worth it you know because you know it's a it's a big sacrifice and it's a big commitment having a film company um and as working as hard as we we do um it's uh it is it's very time consuming but you know when you were saying what do we do well jonathan and myself for instance um about three weeks ago we had to do a recce for one of the films um, so we went and we, you know, I drove, um, we make it a little day trip. We go out, we, we have some breakfast together. Um, we'll go and we'll go and see what we need to see. We'll talk to who we need to talk to. And then we'll go somewhere or we'll have some lunch and we'll talk about exactly what we've seen. What do we need? What do we need to do? And it's, you know, it, it's so not only exciting, but it's so rewarding to actually be with somebody that you can talk to about things that really bloody interest you, you know? Right. I mean, it would be really dull and sad if you did a job and then you went home and you rolled over to your other half and they said, how's your day? And you went, yeah, good. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I know what it's, <laughs> it's really quite a luxury yeah. that we really talk about <laughs> everything, right. you know, um, Hey, that guy was a bit weird, or oh, that was, you know, that wasn't what we were looking for. Or, no, 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 no. We, you know, you have to be nice when you're there. And then, oh no, maybe that wasn't quite right. Or, you know, or oh, that was, you know, whatever. It was we we really do, and it's so nice that we can really bounce things off one another. And that, you know, when if I'm going down one route and Jonathan's like, no, 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 hang on, because you know, I'm learning from the best here, by the way. I'm always learning, and I know everybody's always learning, but I'm you know, I'm kind of learning from the master here. So if I'm going down one way, Jonathan can bring me back to sort of looking at something with different eyes, a different perspective, maybe put a producer head on things. Don't, you know, 
you know, so it it, it really does work. Um, okay. That we do try to spend a lot of time together talking about things and about the movies. And then the other thing we do is we watch a lot of movies together. Um, we always go on our date night to the cinema because we both love the cinema. Um, I also love lots of popcorn, um, which Jonathan hates because he hates me munching in his ear. But um, I, <laughs> he, he, he hates people who eat through a movie. And I'm one of those people that I have, I have a great big thing of popcorn, like throwing it at my face when we're watching anything. <laughs> Um, so, I never knew that about him. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, no, he doesn't. No, 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 no noise, no nothing. Because obviously he's so immersed in the film, and that's right. great. But I am very immersive. I have to like sort of throw it, you know, in my hair and everything when I'm trying to watch a movie. But so, <laughs> so last month we went to see Transformers, um, the the old school one, you know, the anniversary of it. So they showed okay. all the things from the eighties. Um, because th we go to a cinema where they only play old films, and then two weeks before that we saw Con Air. Yeah, you're talking about that, because, yeah. Yeah, because he, he knows that I, I love anything with Nick Cage in, so um, yeah. I have to um, go and see anything that he's in. And actually, he thought it was Face Off, but it was actually Con Air. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we try to see as many movies, and we we have a thing where we don't watch television because we don't, have a we don't actually have a television that we can look at the television. We only have um, DVDs. So... We are constantly watching um, DVDs. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. So when you, uh, so uh, when you're, at, when you're, when you are, because work is embedded with with your relationship, you guys have so much to talk about, and you know it's 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 a day to day uh, routine for you both. Um, does it ever get tiring to you know? You know, if you're talking to Jonathan, you're going out on a date somewhere, and then all of a sudden something comes up. Oh, by the way, this thing comes up. Like, does does that get a little annoying? Or you guys know how to separate? You know, this is let's leave that for an hour. Let's focus on this. Is it a little bit of that for yourself? What, what well, sort of thing comes up? Do you mean? Sorry. Well, like work wise, like work wise, if you guys are out somewhere on yeah. a date, for example, like do you mm -hmm. guys have that separation of work and just spending time? Oh God, together? no. No, oh no, 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 no. I mean, if if Jonathan's phone goes off, it's being picked up. And I think you'd be crazy if you think that in this business that you can just, Jonathan can actually sit there for a whole meal and not be on the phone. It's just crazy to think about. Look, um, I think that if I was sitting there twiddling my hair and being 20, I'd probably be pretty pissed off about it. But I see how damn hard he works. And if that call is being answered that, he's put out and he's expecting it he's going to answer it you know you've got to get your priorities right here look we love one another to death we're with each other all the time and i know how much he loves me and he knows how much i love him i tell him on a hourly basis and so does he with me we get it we 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 are in tune with, with one another and you know things come up you know it's, it's look it's all about timing right. you know um there's, you know, obviously, if you're in a cinema, that's the phones are off anyway. Um, well, mine isn't off because of my son, um, but right. it's on silent and I can still have notifications. But obviously, Jonathan's not going to pick the phone up. I mean, in anything like that, that's ridiculous. Um, but any any other thing, if we're out for a meal or anything, look, we eat all the time. We eat three times a day. You know, I mean, yes, you're out for a romantic dinner, but, you know, romantic dinner and some crisis that's come up with a film i mean you know come on you can eat anytime you know step out and then step back in it's fine so how do you make time for when you're working on because you talked earlier about because uh, i want to go back to this real quick with you about uh working out uh when you're on set is is it does that prove to be a little more difficult to make the time to work out as well too or, or do you have a, do you find a balance to, to make that fit into your schedule yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not that obsessed with it when I'm filming um, okay. because I just we just don't have the time, you know. Um, no, um, but mm. if I'm in my room, I've got some weights in my room and mm. some bands and I'll try and do 15, 20 minutes. Um, I did manage to get to the gym on, on Halloween, but there were, you know, there are times like with um, Nightfall, there was no time. We were doing night shoots. It was pissing it out. I mean, it was honestly the worst weather in England you could possibly have. The rain was just persistent and it really did. There was no let up and it was freezing. It was so cold. And we were filming from seven o'clock in the evening till seven o'clock in the morning. 
And, you know, by the time you get back, um, have a cheeky tequila at the bar to get yourself. <laughs> and it's at seven in the morning when people think, oh, my God, what are they doing while everyone's eating their breakfast? Um, but, you know, it, and then you by put the up time, your American accent afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, by the time we do that, um, that there, there isn't any time for that because you've got to kind of try to unwind after doing mm. what you've done have a hot bath because you're freezing right. um, and then try and eat at some point and um, then make sure you're up by at least three so you can get yourself together, go over, you know, do some, you know, some studying that you need to do and get back on set. So there's no time. It would be nice, but... So, so considering the chaos you guys are going through, I mean, e even in the midst of all that, I mean, you're, you're, I would, I would imagine you're still pretty content. I would say for the most part during that process that it doesn't deter you from, uh, you know, continuing on because obviously you guys have been doing it for a while here, especially Jonathan. But when, when you're in that, like, if when you're in the thick of it, like, do you have that moment of like, oh God, I just, I just want to stop and go and walk away, take a break. Does that ever come to your mind at any point during the during that whole process there? What from the filming? From filming, it just yeah, like, like when you're in the thick of it, like when you're absolutely exhausted, you um, don't have time to do the things that you know. For in this case, like working out, when you're in the thick of it, like does it ever cross your mind? Like I just want to just take a break right now. Like does that come to mind at all at during at any points of the of the your productions? No, I mean, look, no, it really doesn't. I think. Okay. When you've got um, a vision and um, that you're extremely passionate about, there's plenty of time to sleep when you're in your coffin, you know? <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> That's actually one of the most passionate answers I've heard in, in some time. That's a good one. I love that one. Well, okay. Well, then explain to me then about... Um, so when you when you're uh, when you're going through the, the production here for yourself, are you... Because Jonathan, you kind of gave me a, a, an an interesting point of view about how he's looking at various things. And then, you know, he, at one point he was talking about one, one actor that he didn't say the name was, but like someone that could be like Scott Atkins type level. Are you at all a involved with that process too, of looking out uh, scouting, if you will, if you're looking at, Hey, we're got an idea for a movie. I think this is the person that we can look at that could potentially take the lead or whatever the case may be. Are you part of that whole process as well too? Or do you leave that to Jonathan that he chimes in and asks for your opinion on the matter? Um, Jonathan is a very giving person with anything. And if there's any ideas that I've come up with, and there have been a few actors that actually are are in the movies because I suggested it, okay. um, uh, then, you know, yeah, he'll always listen. Okay. But when, when you're doing that for yourself, like what exactly are you specifically looking for? Because in, in terms of business, I guess is what I'm referring to. Are you looking at from some from a standpoint of like, in this case, like a producer that this person has the qualities that we're looking for that could sell the film, you know, embody with what we're looking for as far as, you know, star quality, if you will. Are you looking at it from that perspective? Or are you looking more in a sense of like, who's the best actor that can fit the part and we're going to give them an opportunity to play the said part? Um, I'm looking at it from what will sell the film. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, we want to make money. Right. We're not doing it for a laurel on the whatever you know i mean yes it's great oh it's been in 50 festivals and we have 20 laurels and everything else yeah but is it successful and you know that's sort of how we're looking at things actually um and i think you know the movie business what i'm trying to say is we you know jonathan i mean his, his quality control is is brilliant and he he really does look for quality scripts and you know the things that we're shooting at the minute are out of this world, honestly. Um, so I, I think that the people who are in these movies, I mean, you know, Michael Prey is such a big favorite of ours. Um, Jeffrey's going to have a great career in it because he's just charisma overload and the he absolutely oozes with star quality when he's on screen. Um, you know, Jeffrey Moore, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, pe people like them, they're just, I mean, they, they are brilliant aren't they i yeah. mean 
Do you do you look at uh, with the actors you're working with here uh, as far as like you talk about long term in this case with you know working with Michael and Jeffrey? Um, I mean, are you looking at it with them? And so, for example, like when you're talking to Michael and you're talking with Jeffrey and you're explaining about these upcoming projects here, like do you do you look at it from because because they're, they're friends of yours, right? Yeah. Um, I guess the reason why I'm asking is just because I I'm very curious about you know, the business that's behind it too, because hmm. I, I understand, I understand that, you know, I've heard the, 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 the saying so much, it's not show friends, it's show business. So the reason why I'm asking this question is because I'm, I'm very curious about, you know, the, the, the business side of it when it comes to working with a friend in this case, like, like Jeffrey and Mike, for example. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with them and you're, and you're, and you, you and Jonathan are discussing with about upcoming projects, you love what they've done so far with your, with you, with your production oh. so far. And then, therefore, there's more opportunities for them to come back and do some more. Is there also more in a sense of like these are my friends, or is it also in the sense of like these are friends, but business wise, they offer this, so therefore we can look at it in that way as well too. So I hope the question doesn't come off, I guess, harsh. If it's that's the way I can describe. Oh no, it. it's not harsh at all. It's um, okay. it's quite. It's a it's a very good question because yeah, I think you know, if if somebody can do the job really really well like the two that we've just mentioned mm -hmm. um why not because we know that they're lovely people as well right. so it, it's sort of it's sort of like um you know working with michael for instance he's not only a very generous giving actor he's impeccable on set he's i mean he he really brings his stuff he just he, he he's so easy to work with why not you know why why wouldn't you want to work with somebody like that you know um and actually most people that we work with we we do like to call them our friends after because hopefully we would have like lewis mandalore um working with him on renegades and now you know i mean he's a, a good friend yeah. and i'm you know i'm sure we're going to be doing more work with him and um there there are lots of, of things that you know of opportunities with him and he was such a, a really lovely guy. So why wouldn't you? You know, it's um you know, that that's how I look at it. So I so see. most people and, and with Jeffrey as well, you know, I mean the camera loves him. He he on screen he just looks like a movie star. Um which sometimes is really hard these days because um when you look at things now, you know, when I look back in the I mean I'm in my fifties. Um when I look back back in from the 70s and the 80s and who I absolutely idolized um as a movie star I don't see anybody young being like that I mean I was absolutely gutted when Ryan Gosling's doing this bloody fool guy when yeah. sorry but Lee Majors did it back in the day how can you compare those two it's just impossible you know I grew up with men like Magnum and the professionals and the Sweeney and things where men were men not these sort of mamsy pamsy sort of girly looking guys that you know <laughs> can't fight their way out of a paper bag you know or you wouldn't want to get you know mugged with them standing next to you because you'd end up punching somebody harder it's just stupid uh, you know that's you've got Sylvester Stallone behind you yeah. I know Jonathan would drop anything like that's his that that's his one thing where I say just yeah. go please go if yeah. there was any opportunity to do anything with him yes of course I mean Sylvester Stallone Arnold Schwarzenegger you know we watched The Running Man the other day um, at the cinema as well I mean god you know those, those films brilliant I mean Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah it's funny it's funny you mentioned that just now uh because <laughs> I literally had the same thought, I think a few months ago, I was talking to a good friend of mine about that as well too, where we were discussing uh, how much time has changed with regards to, you know, the the whole culture, if you will. And I'm not going to get into the politics here, but I'm I'm just saying that that we, we were discussing that where we talked about some of our favorite movies and a lot of the films that I grew up watching um, were action films horror films as well too but action films were the films for me that define like what a real man should do in a horrible situation and like death wish right Good death wish him. is a great example exactly. right yeah. yeah so it was like we we were discussing that and we were talking about like I, one of my my favorite action movie of all time and there's a lot of great ones out there but for mm. me i remember as a kid when i saw like that like to me that was the epitome of like what a real action hero should be and that was demolition man like when i saw it as a kid oh, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I, I still to this day it's my favorite action movie of all time. And I mean, are there better ones? Yeah, sure. But I mean, I mean, that, m- I mean mine's all Death Wish, like Charles Bronson. But you know, that I grew up with him and Dirty Harry, and you know, right, those right, right. Yeah. I, I just love them. You know, it's, um, yeah. I but I yeah, I I, I totally understand, and um, I'm I'm so gutted that it's changed so much. You know, because. Well, um, it's funny because I I remember like for example I was the reason why we were talking about this here is because we were talking about you know superhero films that's like the the the, the whole thing. and as a comic book fan like I've read comic books as a kid like I, to me yeah. this is like a beautiful time like I I wish I had this as a kid and I'm glad I have it now I'm not taking that away but the point I'm getting at is this regards to there was I, I remember when we were watching oh, so we were discussing about uh, what was it I think it was Avengers Infinity War I think it was or maybe Endgame one of those two. But we were discussing about the characters. And one of the things we I remember we were pointing out is like, uh, I think I said something to the effect of the sensitivity a lot of the guys had brought into the roles. You know, like, you know, we see Thor, how he was this macho guy. And all of a sudden in time, mm-hmm. he became like this goofy guy. Very sen- Now, I have nothing against that person. I'm, I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. I'm, that's not what I'm getting at here. But the reason why we were discussing about how much times have changed is because like we're, we're talking about Batman. Like, remember Batman? Like, yeah. Michael Keaton's Batman was never like that. I was like, "Yeah, you're right." Okay, like, I'm more Adam West here, by the way. Well, yeah, I I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, I grew up with him, but yeah, right, but I know, we, were, yeah. we were discussing about like the theatrical aspect of it. But, but yes. yeah, I, I know what you're saying though, yeah. and it's, and I grew up with that as well too. But the point yeah. I'm getting at though is with regards to the um, the change of the culture, where a lot of the heroes, especially with more or less the mainstream stuff, has been kind of I'll be honest, a little watered down to, to your to what you were saying as yeah. well too. And then <clears throat> what's funny because I was ta- I was talking to uh, I'm sorry I was uh, I was thinking about the movie Lights Out with uh, Frank Grillo that was written by Chad Law and uh, and Gary Charles both of you guys both of you guys in there know yeah. here yeah and I remember when I was wa- I specifically remember when I was watching that film like this is the kind of shit that I grew up with I was like this yeah. is the kind of movies that should be in theaters that should be uh-huh. playing and I mean, not not that I'm saying that it shouldn't matter how much they make it should but that this would be making big bucks like that's the kind of stuff i want to go see in theaters like this is the yeah. kind of stuff i grew up with and i'm glad the guys like chad law are still out there making these type of films but it's nowhere near the level where it was before back in the 80s and even the 90s and the heroes that we're getting now are very far in between like even the rock i would even say when he's he's playing those guys the movies aren't the same for me they're they're still there but they're just they don't hit the same as it was as it were with you mentioned before dirty harry death wish um, say what say what you will about the sequels, but and who know. have we got? Kevin Hart. I mean, please. Well, I mean, no, Kevin dude, Hart has his some of kneecaps. <laughs> I mean, <sighs> he has his he has his thing, but I don't see him as an action hero. I mean, very few guys do. And to me, I think one of the very last people, as far as mainstreams are concerned, is probably Jason Statham, in my opinion, when it comes to the more more modern guys. Oh yeah, because uh, I remember when I first saw. Transport, because I remember I've obviously I've seen him before with Lockstock and, mm-hmm. and and Snatch, but when I saw him in Transport, I was like, "That's the Lockstock guy." It was fucking amazing to see that yeah. he was something that I remembered as a kid growing up, and I thought, yeah. "This is we're going right back to this again," and then kind of went to you know the direction that it would now. But the point I'm getting is that I agree with you 100. percent But do you think that will change in time though? With you know, yeah, I I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's going to come back. I mean, look, the thing is, the people like Chad Law writing these things and um you know we're trying to do the same thing jonathan's always had a thing to write things for older people because older people want to watch older people you know mm-hmm. mo- most older people don't want to watch 20 year olds running around with guns because they stab one another anyway and they all wear <laughs> hoodies and they all look like they do mm-hmm. um but you know not saying anything but um you know, we do want to watch, you know, these superheroes who we think are superheroes, like, you know, like the Charles Bronsons and the Dirty Harrys and the people yeah. like that. Yeah. But, you know, we, hopefully it will come back. Hopefully there'll be more people writing for older people. Um, <laughs> or let, let's see. Hey. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, too. And I, I, I keep thinking about like Stallone from back in the day where he was he was a sensitive guy, but the sensitive guy that was like tough at the same time like that's that to me was the epitome of like what a man should be whereas arnold was not like that but he had the chauvinistic aspect about him as well too which i thought he did very well but i you know nowadays it seems like it's kind of like in the in the wayside where it's not important anymore i don't know i mean i'm not saying it should it's wrong but i 
I miss those days. And you know, one movie I saw recently, which reminded me of the nineties, which was, I don't know if you, get, if you guys had seen it yet, but it's a uh, Godzilla versus, I'm sorry, Godzilla X Kong, the new empire. You ever oh, seen no. that movie? No, no, no. So, it the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I saw that in theaters with my family and I was so happy to see that movie because, you know, it's, it's, is it the greatest film? No. Is it uh is it is it like an Oscar worthy type? Absolutely not. But the point I'm getting is just that it's a film that reminded me of like when I watched Independence Day, Stargate, like those type of like epic uh uh mm -hmm. action type of films of that sort. That movie was a reminder of that. I was like, so I was like, if they could still make movies like that and be a big hit, imagine what else they could do with like, you know, the bad boys or whatever else, something to that to and on almost same mm -hmm. lines. Like if they can just bring that back and it's become yeah very successful i to me it's kind of like a gateway but that kind of gave me a little sense of hope about maybe we can still kind of get that back somewhere in the near future there so i, I was very optimistic about after seeing that the movie. thing is it's you know this sort of this sort of way at the minute how we have to emasculate men and <laughs> make them the, the sort of the under dog while the sort of the woman conquers the world and has no backstory, but all of a sudden she can fight and she can do this and she can do that. And then she brings her sister and her daughter and her mother and then all three of them take the world on. It's just, you know, look, I mean, I don't know. Maybe the young people want to watch it. I didn't think young people could watch things for more than four seconds without scrolling up personally. But, you know, <laughs> watch movies, yeah. what we want to be watching are not is not that is um so yeah we've been really disappointed with i mean i was so gutted when i saw the omen i just thought what a uh, load yeah, he told me about crap. that as well yeah. honestly it was just so gutting you know when when you look at all the original ones and um you know and i just you know i've never had a problem with the looking at films um you know look the women like robocop and and you know even uh, what was the one oh with arnold schwarzenegger that i watched the other night where she gets the rocket launcher and she fires it behind her oh um the recall yeah 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 total recall yeah yeah, we, yeah we watched that yeah watched that the other night and um you look what a great what a great Hard she had you know yeah. it wasn't like you know she was the like the number two with Arnold Schwarzenegger and mm -hmm. you know I I don't know it wouldn't have worked the other way um but I don't know what the big change is I, I don't know why we're, we're looking at men in this totally different light where they have to break down crying and and go for counseling every two minutes uh you know well, you know it's funny because you, you, earlier you, you talked about how you and Jonathan saw con air in theaters and he thought it was gonna be face off like what's funny is that i remember what was it nicholas cage had said that when he read the script for that part uh what intrigued him was the fact that in the beginning he, his character the, well, he, the character he played was a very he was just a uh, a very uh you know pompous asshole you know he was out he was just out about? for a face off so for his face, character. So right, in the yeah. beginning of the yes, film, so I love his that film, right? So in the beginning of the film, his his character was an asshole. Yeah. But then the switch occurred where he becomes oh, yeah. John Travolta's character, and he, he could became, actually make love to his wife and stuff. Yeah. Right. So he's a very <laughs> sensitive guy, and he's yeah. very, you know he's very broken. Yeah. But for that particular story, it made a lot of sense why yeah. it turned out that way. And you know, and it's funny because you mentioned that about you know guys breaking down, but like there's always a place for that as long as there's a, a purpose for that that fits to the overall narrative. And to me, like I always tell people that you know there's a lot of great action films like yeah, but there's dramas that do it much better. It's like uh, you've got to watch Face Off, you've got to watch Demolition Man, you mm -hmm. have to watch mm -hmm. Cobra, you have to watch uh, uh, True Lies. It's great if you want to talk about you know yeah. women who are gonna be uh who start off docile and then change you know uh, yeah. to yeah. a stronger person i mean, I mean jamie lee Curtis when she did that yeah. strip that that was the funniest yeah. thing. that was so good when that she was fell a funny scene yeah. yeah i loved that and then like you know all the you know brilliant in the end where they just like get the hangar like tip it at the back and it blows up and they just walk through you know <laughs> from what she started off with yeah i mean i mean those are fantastic films you know yeah. they're the films that are, are so exciting but then she's holding hands with the hero like that's what women want we want to hold hands with the hero we don't want to be dragging the guy saying come on you know we're the hero and we're dragging them right i think it's just so changed like you know um you know i don't know i just i, I find it all very confusing i think it's because of my age but i don't care <laughs> i well i mean i'm not that far off myself either but i think it's one of those things where um i don't know i stay in my lane when it comes to that because uh, i mean I, I do watch a lot of mainstream, so I'm, I'm not saying that you know there's not good ones out there. There, there are, hmm. but when I do watch a lot of uh, 
action films more so now it's a lot straight uh, more uh, vod releases because they're the ones that tend to fit more my liking as yes. opposed to some of the more mainstream one because guys like chad laws are the ones that are out there making stuff scott act is a good example as well too oh. um so it's it's interesting that when people say to me that they don't have the films like they used to it's like they they are out there you just have to look the caveat when I tell them that is that well, where do I look? I said, well, just look up on IMDb, look up on it. I'll give you the recommendation. Yeah, I, I think I think when we were saying that they're they're not out there like they used to be, like we can't go to the cinema right. and watch something that we want to watch. You know, um Well, they're on mainstream. I mean, sorry, they're on streaming, but I mean, again, there's so much in the catalog that how are you gonna sift through all of that and decide which one yeah. is even good? Because the posters do a horrible job in some cases, but when you watch the movie, it's night and day. Oh, so yeah, that's some the films are, are just terrible, aren't they? You know, sometimes they do, you know, you sort of scroll, scroll up because, you know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing. But I mean, I, I think, you know, in time, you know, because uh, uh, I was asking John this before about like the guys like the Chad Laws, uh, you know, those, uh, the Brandon Slagos who are making these films, like, do you think we'll get them in the more or less the mainstream side of it where they get to make those movies that we grew up watching and have them have more or less full control? I mean, I guess it's just a matter of like, more timing and opportunities and you know what it's actually selling and at the same time if the student is willing to give them the opportunity to let them take the chances and hopefully make the films that we want to see that i want to see and i'm sure you as well too but i mean do you think that'll ever be a chance where we get to see those guys move up that ladder if you will let's, <laughs> I, let's I think hope. that's an honest answer too all mm -hmm. right so let's transition to something else here because uh as you as you already know, one of the reasons why I also wanted to talk to you too has to do with uh, diabetes, type one diabetes. Hmm. And oh. I've I've always wanted to have this conversation with somebody here because I I had this conversation before with a previous guest, uh, where I actually made it out there publicly, if you will. Not that I was trying to hide it purposely, but it just never came up. So I was very surprised to see in one of your posts from last year, actually, when you had talked about uh, your more or less your activism with diabetes. And then I found out your son uh, has type 1 diabetes as well, too. In fact, if I recall correctly, you said he was born with it. Is that right? He had it from when he was 18 months. 18 months. Okay. If you don't mind, to, because I want to get your perspective on it and how that mm -hmm. was like for you and Jonathan when it, when it occurred. And, you know, in your messages you had, you had sent to me, and I was going back with you on it as well, mm -hmm. too, you had expressed a lot of... Uh, frustration from your experiences the concerns you've had and then uh you know what the ups and downs that comes with it as well too many of the, which i can relate to but i'm you know i've got my mother's perspective you know what mm -hmm. it was like for her but I, i'm very curious about your perspective considering that you're because when i was diagnosed i was officially diagnosed when i was 17 just before i turned 18 so i've had it for well over 20 years at this point but because i've had it later in my life if you will your son had it at the, pretty much at the very beginning. Baby, yeah. So for right. yourself, what was it like having to go through that at a very uh, young part of your life with your son, and then up to this point now, like how much, like how much do you, do you feel like has changed when it comes to how you look at the whole this whole situation for you? And and granted, we're we're at a, both myself and your son as well too. We are at a time where the accessibility and the medicine has gotten so much better. Where back in the day was like you know if you had it you're left to die and you you were on your run kind of a point. guesstimation years ago wasn't it it was like right. oh well, i think that's about three units yeah let's do right. that oh dear it's a hypo never mind let's give you some sugar and glucose to get you up again or yeah. some orange juice or yeah it was a real it was a real struggle. i mean look i mean i think my my biggest um hate for um the diabetes community type one specifically um is the lack of empathy and the lack of knowledge, the, the lack of any form of um, social media, um, like being part of it and getting behind it and really pushing it so it's in people's eyes. Um, I think I think it's really hard for people with type one diabetes. And this is why I don't really wanna talk about how difficult it was for me because Yes, it was. And that's just how it's going to be. And it's going to be difficult for anyone's mum who's dealing with a type 1 decorated child. But I want to say how difficult it is for the person going through it and all the children going through it or the babies going through it because there is no let up with it for them. It's 24 hours. 
seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and it's never ending. And it really is stressful for them. You know, even my son the other night, um, he was up, I was up with him three or four times. He had a hypo, then he kind of over put the glucose in, then he was high, then he had to re-inject because he had mm-hmm. to get him down. Then he was up, he was thrashing around all night, sweating because he was, went high again. And, you know, it, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So he had sort of from about one o'clock in the morning till five, he was over 16. And, you know, you can't stack the insulins. You could kind of watch it coming down. Um, and the poor boy had to go to school. You know, he, he he came down at about six o'clock and I saw him, I looked at him and he was sleeping peacefully. Well, he leaves for school at seven o'clock in the morning. So he's up at 20 to seven. Um, and I just thought, how on earth? I was dragging myself around that day thinking, oh my God, I'm exhausted, drinking coffee all day. I had to go to the gym. I've got to run my thing, do my things that I'm doing for the day. And I just thought, wow, he's got a history test. You know, mm-hmm. um, and I just thought that's it's it's a really hard it's hard work having diabetes. You know, it's a second job. You've yeah. got to do what you've got to do, and then you've got to stay alive. Yeah, and that's the bottom line. It's about staying alive. It you know, insulin is just um, you know, it just takes care of you day to day. It's not a cure. No. It's just life support. Yeah, and people don't take that seriously you know they don't take it seriously that you know if someone has a hypo you know can go into a coma hello hi guys can we just um yes it is you know i yes i am running onto the rugby pitch with a with a jelly baby or i'm you know um (laughs) it's 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 hard you know but um i just wish there i've i've run four london marathons for it i've i've you know fundraised i've try to do lots of things. And actually um, I was talking to Jonathan because um, on the last, on Renegades, we had three people on our set with type one diabetes. And when I um, saw this young lad, actually he's going to be working for us again on our next film. Um, I'm not going to mention his name because if you, you know, um, but he was wearing a, a CGM monitor, a, yeah, glu- yeah. a continual glucose monitor. Um, the Libra freestyle ones. And I saw it on his arm and I thought, oh, okay. Um, so I sort of went up to him when he was by himself and I just said, well, you, um, you know, do you need insulin um, to, you know, are you type 1 diabetic? And he went, yeah, I am. God, how do you, how did you know? You know, and I was like, oh no, I have a son. And he went, oh, oh, I can relax, you know. And he was so sort of like, and I said, don't worry, I'll keep an eye on you on set. Yeah. And there was a time where we were actually filming and it was one of my scenes and he had to hold this, you know, the equipment and stuff. And he was, and he really looked like he was flagging. And I said to him, you know, do you want to stop for a minute? And and he was low. Yeah. So he stopped. And I and I said to everybody, no, we're stopping. That's it. 15 minutes. We're, we're having a rest. And I just, you know, and we had two other people with type 1 diabetes. And I, and I was talking to him after. And I said to him, you know, I really want to do a documentary about it, you know talking to people with it and and he's all for it you know and so you know in the future maybe there might be something that i do as a bit of a passion project to to really it's look it's not a sexy disease you know people don't walk around with pink bras and pink ribbons and you know it's it's not these moonlight walks and high heels and bras and it's just not ever going to be that but it you know, I did a, I did lots of charity events when um, my other children were at school. I, I did a, I used to go around to the schools and I used to talk about type one, and um, make them aware, show them what a healthy breakfast is, and um, how you know, food. It's all about food, right. all about carbohydrates. Everything is a bloody carbohydrate. Yeah. People just eat pasta and rice, but it's not. You know, carbohydrates. Just you know, I was surprised there's carbohydrates yeah. and vegetables. I was like, really? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, um, we, I did a, a, a onesie day for type one. So everyone brought a pound in and they could wear their onesie. So we raised, you know, a thousand pounds for the, you know, the junior ADRF and, um, you know, it's, it's just little things like that, that I've always been involved with and just trying to make it like, okay, it's, I know it's diabetes, but it's getting more common now in, in young people. 
And I think that yeah. um, there should be more people aware that, you know, if someone's looking a bit confused or they're, you know, like walking a bit weird or whatever, you know, just, just check in on them, you know. Yeah. I think people walk past people so often now. I, I want to go back to something real quickly before we go further with this here, because you said something earlier, just as we were discussing about this, that really piques my interest in it. And I hope you don't mind me digging, mm. try to dig a little bit deeper, but not too much, but just a little bit. You didn't want to talk about your perspective too much, but I'm I'm really curious about your perspective. You kind of gave me a lot of it from, from what you're describing here, but mm. I, I was really curious more about how... Because you know when when you were messaging me back and forth about this, you know you you express a lot of frustration, mm. um, because of not, just what you describe right now the 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 lack of empathy and the the, the lack of knowledge and just people's perspective on it uh, overall. Mm. And uh, trust me, I know exactly what you mean. Oh yeah, you just eat too many sweets. Oh yeah, well, you know well, that when, too. when you grow out of it. It's, uh, but uh, I think. I think the one thing that, uh, cause like I, I was, my son literally just asked me about this. Uh, I think it was last week and yeah, he knows I have been type one diabetes. Um, I mean, he's man, I've had it since he was born obviously, but the, what he was asking me specifically was more about understanding the, the purpose of checking the sugar and why, why, what I'm eating, how it affects my day. And so on. So I, I went this whole a more or less a condensed version of like what my day-to-day -day routine is like and why I have to, you know, what I'm eating. And, I, you know, you can eat whatever you want, but you have to consider how much insulin you got to put in, what you're going to do before, after, uh, the effects of the next day. Uh, Because I was telling him before, you know, I, I eat really well. But once in a blue moon, there are times I just want to have a cookie. And if I have a pack of cookies, then I know how it's going to affect me all day tomorrow where my sugars are probably going to be spiking up and and those are the consequences that I have to that I have to deal with are they difficult no but having to keep checking and injecting that's not the fun part you know and and I was telling him that because before before uh before I was diagnosed which was funny is that I was I just started working out and I'm working out I've gained some muscle and then all of a sudden I'm losing all the muscle and I'm peeing all the time the whole bit you were high then, right it was I was it was high. HBA, and I didn't know, right, level it was, just, it was, high, it was right. so yeah. so high, and I had no idea. I, I, my mom was, if it wasn't for my mother, I probably honestly uh, there's probably a good chance I would have ended up dead because yeah. my mother, because uh, my grandmother, her mom, was type two diabetic, so she knew the symptoms. Yes. And so I think you're diabetic, and I remember one time too. I'll never forget. I was donating blood at my high school, and I was explaining to the lady like what I was feeling, and I was like, I'm having these like weird drops of like just like just weird it's like i don't know it's like almost i'm high or something that i've never was i was never high before but i was explaining to her from what i understood is like, i think you're type one diabetic i was like no nah, that's not that's impossible and then two months later whatever it was i was diagnosed but my mom had picked up on the symptoms and she was telling me you know and i remember i couldn't see certain distances it was like a big blurry uh, vision that i had so it was really really weird and I explained to my mom and she's like you have type one and i got i was so bed bedridden at that point that she took me to the hospital but there, so I mean, I'm getting her perspective of how it was like for her. And then I'm seeing my sister and my brother. I remember my sister was crying too because right. she didn't know the, the consequences and neither did I. But it's seeing the effect on how the immediate impact, finding out what it was for my family. And I, I'll never forget my doctor's the doctor's reaction. We went to the ER and they were like, oh yeah, you know, that, that, that reaction of like, you know, okay, he's got it. And I'll never forget that look, but it didn't feel the impact on me. I just didn't know what was going on. And they're like, "Yeah, your sugar's really high. You have type one diabetes." I was like, "Oh," I said, and, the, and I, I swear I'm not making this up. It's not like I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm joking, but I'm not. I remember thinking, "Okay, well, it just means I can't have candy then. I can have pizza, I can have burgers." That's the first thing that went through my head. That's how immature I was at that point with regards to the how to deal with diabetes, and having. <laughs> Having been through the hospital at that for that week and being educated, I had no idea how much responsibility there was mm -hmm. simply off the food alone. That's mm -hmm. just the food. And now understanding the the lifestyle choice I have to make and the decisions I have to make about all these various things. And it became difficult because I just didn't know any better. And then eventually in time, I figured it out what works and what doesn't work. I'm still figuring it out as we go along. But I will say, though, that I've made a lot of bad choices as a diabetic eating terrible food i've gained a lot of weight i've dropped the weight gained it back and then i've lost the weight and haven't gone back since 
but it's it's something that it took you me a while amazing, to figure it out. Boy. What was that? You do look amazing. You look amazing, by the way. Oh, thank you. you. I appreciate pretty, that. Pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but it's it wasn't it wasn't an overnight thing to get to the point where like okay, this is the consistency I have to keep because like, I made a lot of bad choices, a lot of great choices. Then, but so, but the the at the end of the day, it was really about you know what 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 am I going to do about it? And I think that's kind of the bottom because I can't depend on everybody else to figure it out for me. My wife, to her credit. I, I, she can tell you how many countless nights where I've had low blood sugar and I woke up sweating and I'm like in a pool of like water, like what had happened and my wife was feeding me. So, you know, to her credit, she's always been there for me. And same with my mother too. Um, and it's like, it's one of those things where I also had to understand that I couldn't take for granted all the, 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 the concerns that they're expressing and my lack of responsibility for not taking care of myself because of, you know, I just wanted to have a burger and I ejected myself 18 units or whatever else. Because I thought I was going to, in, in a over so many bad decisions on that. And I mean, those are my experiences, but then hearing the experiences of my wife and my mother and everyone else around me, my jobs as well too. Like when you hear that perspective, that to me is just as important, which is why, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of going off a tangent, which is why I'm going back to want to hear your perspective too, because I think it's just as important to hear yeah. someone else's, you know, in this case, like a parent to understand what they go through and having Thank that you. child understand mm -hmm. the parent's perspective too. Sure. I think the, um, the, the one thing that frightens me the most about it is that you have this little in, insulin injection right. and too little of it can kill you and too much yeah. of it can kill you. Yeah. So it's it it's a responsibility. This this little injection is 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 like kryptonite. You yeah. know? In a lot of ways it kind of is. It's such a powerful thing <laughs> that is um it's it's really frightening. And um I think as a perspective, I think I used to really be quite angry um about why him why did he have to have it so young mm. i've had three children before and um i'm older now i had him when i was 40 and i know what i'm doing and everything's great and we have this lovely little family of four and then all of a sudden carpet ripped away from under our feet and um we were dealt the cards of that and i think i've always raised Gabriel to, um, I mean, he's got a very apt name as being an angel because he really is the most empathetic child that I've ever, I've ever met. Um, and I think he really um, has, you know, when somebody says it doesn't define you, you know, whatever you have, you can't let that define you. I think that you can use it for your benefit. And I think yeah. that He's the person that if someone falls over or hurts himself, he runs to them and he's always helping. He's helpful. He's um, learned the resilience. He's learned um, to tolerate things, pain, and you can't have that. No, you can't. Everybody else is having it. You can't. You know, he's learned to wait. Okay, you're high at the minute, darling. You can't have that. Well, wait till you get you've heard wait a long time i bet you've heard wait yeah. uh, for a lot of many years yeah. yeah um and i think him having it young has made him choose wisely of what he wants to do when he's older and um at the moment he um well he's always from a, a sort of young age i've kind of steered him into uh the a role this which will be really fitting for him and he wants to be a diabetic doctor that's good. He, that, he wants to dedicate his life so to that. Here. That's, that's very interesting. interesting. And I think that I said, you are the best person for the job. Because we had a doctor a couple of months ago, and he, he was so rude and so, well, you know, this is what you got to do. And I said, yes, it's very well you saying that when you leave here at 5.30. Thank you very much. But we've got to live with it for another 24 hours and then another 24 hours, and it never goes. So yeah. you can sit there and say, yes, he's had a bad month. He's growing, you know, testosterone and blah, blah, blah. He's 12. He's nearly, he's 13 next week. Um, it's it's really hard, you know, with all the different growth spurts and stuff to get the balances right. Um, and he said, 
yeah, he said, you know, when I'm a diabetic doctor, I, I'm going to treat children. And I'm never going to speak to them like that. Yeah. Because he doesn't know, does he? He doesn't know how hard it is. And he doesn't know. And I said, exactly. I said, but you're going to be the best at that. You're going to be, you're, you're going to find out the best thing and you're going to be the best at it. And all I can push him to do is to be the best at that, to take it and really do something with it. What what's your, what is, has been the hardest thing for you to witness for yourself, apart from the, you know, the lack of empathy from, in this case, doctors and some other people, but like when you see your son um, go through something in relation to his diabetes where you, it, it hit you the hardest. And when, and when I'm talking about hit you the hardest, it made you break down or, oh, yeah. you know, just like, okay. what, 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 what? Apart from having a coma, apart from being in a coma when he was three, which was pretty um, awful. Yeah. Apart from that, um, I think never being invited to a birthday party. Yeah, what do you mean by that, though? Like, because I think I remember you mentioned that before, but could, could you explain more in details about what that, what, what exactly? Yeah, um, I mean, when he was at junior school, um, we call it junior school when you go to school from age four to um, eleven, and then you go so to elementary is, is the equivalent. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So when um, at elementary school, sorry, um, he was never invited to a birthday party ever. Because never of his diabetes? Play. Yeah. Never had a play date, never had anything. Because um, and I think that was from the school when I, I went in well, he came home from school one day and he was very quiet and um, you know, he wasn't saying too much. And I said, Oh, you know, how was school? What was like, you know, and he was like, Oh no, nothing, nothing. And um at the end of the day I said, Come on, you know, what what's up? You know, there's something wrong, what is it? He said, Mummy, I I just don't like eating my lunch in the cupboard. I said, what? Yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah. I, said, yeah. I said, what? I said, no, you're not eating your lunch in the cupboard. He said, no, 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 I, I have to eat in the stationary cupboard. And I said, right, okay, so why are you eating in the stationary cupboard? He said, well, because it's not fair on the other children. The teacher said it's not fair on the other teach, um, children, me testing my blood um, in front of them because, you know, it's not fair on them. And I said, right, okay. Right. And I talked to him about it and I, I, you know, obviously made him feel better. And, and I went straight up to that school <laughs> and was, you know, I, I was up in arms about it. And um, from then on, I thought, right, I have to come into this school and talk to the children, talk to the teachers, make them, you know, it's not going in that the, the hospital has to go and have the training courses with them, you know, treating him like some sort of leper. It's, um, you know, or what they used to do is they had a rule that he could never inject um, near anybody. So he'd have to go to the medical room and do any of his blood testing because back when he was there, it was all finger pricking. There wasn't the, the you know, the, the continual. You know I, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know what's funny about that? I, I still do that. I still do the finger pricking. Um, is, does your son not like doing that at all? Is it just more convenient with having the patch on him? Well, the thing about finger pricking is um, it's when he was tiny, because he had done it for like 10 years, right. his fingers just used to bleed all the time. He okay. could just touch something and because there's like baby fingers, you know, right, right, I mean, right. you imagine finger pricking an 18 month old yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's from all of those years and they would get really hard, you know, they'd harden up a bit. Yeah, so gallus, yeah. Lost sort of the feeling, yeah, yeah. To, to something. So um, when he was um, 10, we um, we got the continual glucose monitor yeah. and it's changed our life. It's completely changed our life. I have it on my phone, which right. I have in, like with me all the time for his updates. Um, and it's it, it gives you to the minute to the minute I can see, I can look at my phone at any time of the day and know exactly what his bloods are doing. Interesting. So he can go on a school trip and I can text him, ah, you, you need to inject, the, you know, test your bloods. Or I can say, oh, he'll send me a photograph of his food if there's no calorie counting, you know, that, you know, he, you're eating off a menu that has no calorie carbohydrates counted. So I'll right. look at it and I'll tell him how much to, you know, how many carbohydrates there are in that meal does he because so f forgive me if i'm if i when i'm asking this here if it, if it may come up the wrong way because it's i don't mm. i don't mean to but does he know how to count his own carbs and oh and, yeah 
and and it's because like if he's sending you pictures like uh, 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 what, what, why is he sending you the pictures for you to do it for? If, I mean, if again, he's I'm on not a, trying to be... No, no. Oh, no, 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 please. It's a good good question. Um, if he's on a school trip and he's eating in a restaurant, right. um, sometimes, um, you know, if he's eating a pie, it's got more crust on it than, you know, I know exactly what I'm making at home and his school knows, like, at the lunch times that they've got the carbohydrates there. But if you're eating out, you know, sometimes things aren't done, like the chips are on a plate, well, okay, <laughs> let me just, up, you know, he might yeah. overdo it, which I don't want him to do. So yeah. he'll send me a picture and say, I've injected this for this. Is that right? Yes. Or no. Or maybe injects a little bit more. So like or, a second opinion basically is what yes. it's coming down to. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I got it. Yeah, chips, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, French fries, um, those are the, <laughs> oh, those sorry, are the bane yeah. of my existence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 them, yeah. But I don't eat them as much as I used to, but. They're so amazing. But anyways, um, but you were saying, though, because I want to go well, back I was to... Gonna, you... Actually, I just wanted to say something about yeah. um, the, the pasta and um, bread as well. Um, because do they panic you as well, pasta and bread? I'm sorry? Do they, do they sort of panic you as well, pasta and bread? Oh, to... oh, yeah. You know, I don't eat pastas like I used to. Um, I've, I do avoid them completely. My son does. And I've never been tempted to to take a bite of them anymore. Um, okay, can I just um, suggest something? It's just yeah. some research has been done, and sure, it's what sure. I do now. Um, so if you cook the pasta and mm -hmm. do exactly what pasta you'd like, whatever you want to put in it, um, when it's warm, put it in the fridge and eat it the next day cold, and your GI and the glucose um, really? index go straight down, and you don't go high. Really? Yeah, cold pasta from the fridge. Um, <laughs> the the glucose index goes straight down. It's with a pasta, and if you freeze your bread, okay, and put it in the toaster for your toast. Well, mm -hmm. Eng we're English, or so we have tea and toast in the morning. You know, it's, right. it's a, sort of that's what we we do. Um, yeah. sometimes I don't know if it's a very American thing to do, but um, if you freeze your bread and you have your toast. Um, or your sandwiches with the frozen bread is exactly the same. The the glucose index goes straight down. I didn't know that. Where did you find that out? Um, I am uh, just, I just am always researching. And okay. um, yeah. I'll, I think I'm going to try that one day. Because uh, it's funny you say that because my son literally has pasta in the, in the, in the fridge that he actually made. <laughs> and it's actually uh, in the refrigerator right now. So. I'd be tempted to try that just based on what you're saying, and I'll let you know how, uh, how what my reaction is. But um, but I, I did want to go back be, uh, before about um, before I uh, when I was uh, when I asked you about the 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 sensor here. But you talked about just uh, where we were conversing about your son's um, not being invited to parties due to diabetes and your reaction to because I was I wanted to get like what was the hardest thing for you to deal with when it comes to him having diabetes and people's uh dealings with that so with regards to the lack of invites he was getting um was was the diabetes also a factor for him i mean did i, I hope you don't remember but did, did he have friends growing up knowing that he had diabetes and how they and what was their reaction to him and how were they treating him as a result of him being diabetic and having to check himself considering how the school had handled that uh with him being put in the cupboard or not checking his sugar, you know, just the whole system, uh, the way it's set up at school, did that parlay into his friendship outside of that as well, too, where they looked at him the same yeah, way, Yeah, he too? didn't have too many friends growing up, actually, yeah. um, which is quite sad. But um, we have a very tight family. Um, he has siblings right. and, and us, and um, he always grew up with the big houseful. You know, the dog bouncing around, a brother, two sisters, all of their friends, and they all used to sort of do things together. And, um, you know, that's how we just got by. Um, he's a really good friend now, and he has some nice friends. Um, he's older now, so he can right. hides it well, but let's just say, because it's not the first thing he wants to introduce himself as. So lots of his friends actually didn't know he had it. Um, and um, I had a chat with him and just said, look, you know, you're getting older and um these boys they just need to know his his rugby team knew obviously the the guys that he plays rugby with um 
but you know friends at school and I said look you know if you fall over one day or you need to let you know your guy friends know that you know you've got jelly babies with you and it's fine he just doesn't want to be different doesn't want to stick out and the great thing about the cgm monitor on his arm is that you just scan your phone you just look at your phone you scan it on your arm it's done there's no getting a anything out with your son playing rugby uh because i i had the scanner too uh i think it was the same thing that you saw with the 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 Libra lifestyle one, if I remember correctly. Yes, the freestyle Libra. Yes. Yeah, the freestyle. So I had that one. Too. I forgot which version I had at the time, but I had it on. And my biggest problem for me, and I don't know if your son had gone through or has is still going through this now, is that I sweat very, very easily, and it mm-hmm. comes off all the time. So I had been recommended by a paramedic actually uh, that they said that there's like some skin glue that you can put on that will keep the adhesive on tight and yeah, and all I've that. It still kept coming off. Uh, I had a major problem too. Where is it a spray? Was it a spray one? No, it was like one of those like a, like a little like has a it was a, a container that had a little dip, you know, a little sponge at the end, and you can just lather mm-hmm. it around. So that's what I use. I forgot what what the uh, brand was that I bought. My wife actually bought it for me, but um, but I put it on and it lasted. But I kept running into the problem where it was on me, and then the sensor would stop working, and they would come back on, and it was just it was it was a whole mess for me that. For me, it, it found, I found it more suitable to just go the analog way, which is testing it with breaking my finger. And I've been with that ever since. In fact, I, I literally have it in front of me right now. I tested right before I came on to, uh, to speak with you. And I write everything down. And the meter that I have here with me is a uh, one you can get at the store because now it's everything's available now at the store. Where you can buy testers and everywhere yeah. else. So it's convenient that way. But the test that I have here does have the the you know the average amounts, you know what my levels were, the timing, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I I figured out what works for me, and I think it's the best way for me, which is that I write all my uh, my levels out, the time, or I, I round it. I don't put the exact time; I just round it up yeah. to you know fives or whatever else. So I put them I put the numbers down, and then I write down if I'm injecting myself, how many use I inject, so I have something that I can go back on, and if it's really low, what did I take? So two cubes of gummies or whatever else I have with me, I write down that, and then. And it seems to work better for me, especially where, where I work now, because because where I work, I'm constantly moving. Mm-hmm. So, and I have a fanny pack on me as well too, where I have my meter, my la- my my notepad, my my insulin, my pen, the, the snacks I have on with me as well mm-hmm. too. So, if in the event, if it were to drop, and everyone knows I'm diabetic, but yeah. if it were to come to the point where it just completely drops and I'm not, you know. Uh, aware of what's going on yeah yeah right so they have well he's a diabetic okay what's what was his level he has a notepad and so it's all written out for them because i find it more convenient for everyone else to have access to that and i i tell them too if i come to the point where i'm not aware of what's going on and you guys need to know how what's happening look at that book all i yeah. say to you is that if it's low do not inject me that's the first thing i tell everybody don't inject me give me something to have all this stuff you know but it should never come to that point, at least from my perspective. But at least if it does, you know they're aware of what's going to happen. So for your son, on the other hand, I'm curious for from his perspective, from what you can see, um, has it ever come to the point where you know him playing rugby, being tackled, and does it come off? And if it does no. come off, no, nothing mm-hmm. like that at all. No, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to send them to you. It's a spray adhesive. I've gone through the same thing as you. You know, with them falling off and. He has a bath, it's off. He jumped in a swimming pool, straight off. Um, But this one that I've um, found now is I need an actual sprayed um, adhesive remover to get it off. Well, what's it called? I'm going to write it down. um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm going to photograph it and I'll send it to you. Okay, okay, okay. So with the the amount of uh, activity your son does, um, does, does your son... So I, I'm curious about his practice. Like for myself, like when I go mm. work out or if I'm doing any sort of active mm. hiking, whatever it is, mm. I, I'm sure you already know there's a constant, I have, I have to check it and how much do I got to bring it up? And depending mm. how much I'm bringing it up, what am I going to be eating? And then after I come back from it or even during the whole process of working out, hiking, less with working out because I already figured out a, a, a rhythm, I'm sorry, a, a routine that works for me so where I can just work out straight and not have to worry about um, checking it all the time. But for your son, though, um, did you were you part of the process of helping that figure it out, or was he does he uh, does he have a, a routine that works for him as far as prepping for practice for a game, and then 
what he's going to do after all the said practices and the games that, that he's going I mean, to partake look, in. You know, look, I've always said with diabetes, it's a family disease. It's okay. not it's not a one person disease. It's it's you can't he can't that, do yeah. that. You know, he he can't do all of that. He can't think about all of that. He can't prep, do this, do that, think about the game, think about and then have to what perform, you know, doing what you're doing or what he has to do or you know, it's it's impossible. You you can't put that on one person. It's it's not a it's 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 too much to control. Um I think, you know, I think you need people around you. You need people, you know, like your wife in bed next to you. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, look, I, 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 I had yeah. you know, a friend of mine died age 32 of type 1 diabetes um, because her boyfriend didn't come home that night. Um, he stayed out at a friend's house when he was, he, I mean, look, he was meant to be coming back. It, it, it wasn't because of an argument or anything. It was just because he'd had a drink and he had stayed out. You know, it's irrelevant. But anyway, she um, was sitting watching the TV with a, glass of wine in her hand and she just had two sips out of it but she went low and that was it so look it's it's um i'm very aware of that and that happened when i was 32 so that was years ago now um so i've always been aware of that um that things like that can happen um it was funny because i i went to school with her as well so she had it from when she was nine so i'd seen it you know um all the way through but um i think Sorry, what was the question again about the the planning? Well, uh, with regards about his prep to you know how much he's going to be uh, eating to bring his sugar up so he can hmm. practice and burn off whatever he needs, or you know having to keep checking in between all that, and then when he's done with it, uh, what he's doing after the fact, eating wise. So, like, is there a routine that he's got yeah. down to? Not, to, not really. No, there's no, there's no right. routine. As I say, diabetes the best. Um, the only sort of eating disorder disease that there is that's actually no one gives a shit about. But yeah, because you're checking, you're checking, checking, checking. What have I done? What if it's my high, my low? Am I to, oh, I'm high. That means I can work out more because I need to burn it off. But then you go like, I mean, anytime we do anything that needs to do like hiking, walking, he always goes low. It, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how high he starts or, you know, or how many, he always will go low. So it's that sort of, ah gabriel's low again you know sort of like in you know in my mind i'm like oh here we go you know it's like that's the you know when we go for a dog walk it's we've not actually hit that oh wow you know i mean it's, it's rare i mean sometimes we go oh my god we've been for a dog walk and he hasn't had a hypo great you know because we don't just go for a little 10 minutes it's a bit of a stomp you know an hour's sort of walk usually mm -hmm. on the beach and sort of running around and throwing things throwing stones at the the water and um but it's, you know, the heat affects it. The, you know, it's very hot here at the minute. It's um, really caught us off guard because we are not used to the sun here. <laughs> <laughs> there was 28 degrees today. So obviously it's all haywire. Right. Um, um, so, yeah, I think it's just, uh, and I think as well, we haven't really got into the groove of it really because growing the... Uh, testosterone so it all goes a bit tits up when they in the growth spurt phase with regards to earlier you mentioned before about you wanted to do a documentary for for type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. um is is that something you're considering doing under shogun as well too is that something that might be a, like a, a new avenue for for the production coming to look into as well or just this is strictly just a genre of production that focuses i on think it would sort of be a, a one-off um, okay. Just because it's something that's so passionate. Well, it affects Jonathan, myself, right. my, my family. Um, I think that, you know, so I've got a notification as well. Sorry. Yeah, um, um, so, yeah, I mean, that that would be something. So I just have to, because he's 3.8. So that's a hypo, if nobody knows. Um, Is he handling it right now? Yeah, I'm just on the yeah he's on it okay um so uh so then um so i get a buzz if he goes under four right and if he goes above 10 um so i think that um it would be something as a one-off sorry as i was saying um because it is something that affects you know our life 
But when you're, as far as the documentary concerned, because I'm sure it's something still brewing in your head about how you want to go about it. But mm. are you are you wanting to focus on having to not necessarily just bring up more awareness, but the, like because I understand your perspective a great deal, believe me. But I, from my from my perspective, I I, I always find it. Um, it's not just an educational thing, but it's also like a self awareness too, if that makes any sense. Where, you know, you like, like I told you before, when I was talking about earlier with regards to how I was not, how I was very irresponsible with my diabetes and how it affected my, my wife, my mother, my, everyone else, my son, everybody. And, you know, like I, I remember there was an incident one time. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, this is one of those, this was a really big wake up call for me. Where I my sugar was dropping, but I failed to realize it was dropping, and I was in the middle of a conversation, and in the in the midst of the conversation that I was having with my my sister's friend, uh, her husband's friend too, and I was just getting really into the conversation. I was like, I, I guess you could say the heat of the passion, if you will, and the guy was like, "Man, this is way too much. This is, I'm feeling uncomfortable." And and was walking away, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" And I had no idea that I was dropping and then i tested my sugar immediately afterwards i don't think i don't remember if, if i tested it out of my own will or if my wife i can't remember the details but i do remember that i tested it and i was like oh it was low and i went back to the guy and i said i am so sorry my sugar was dropping and i was uh i have no idea i had no idea it was dropping i am not a bad person i was in the heat of the moment but that's not an excuse like i had to go through this whole like rolodex of like what had happened and then Thankfully, my sister and her husband talked to the guy, and he heard them out. And then he said, "Hey, I'm I, I get it. I, it's not a big deal." So that self awareness for me is something that I think, if you were doing a documentary, I'm, I'm not telling you what to do, obviously, but if if you were doing that, like that's something to me that would be much more. I think it's educational for mm -hmm. a diabetic and also the the everyday person, if you will, that's not diabetic to be aware of too of like. Those little nuances, those little instances where like you don't think about it, yeah. but how you present yourself comes off the wrong way. But because you have a because of this this uh I don't know if it's a disease, I think it's a condition, because a disease is not like something like, I always look at a disease like you can catch it and then it could be sorted out with medicine. This is not the situation, that's how I look at it for myself. But I I look at this as a situation where something like that is very, very important because the person you're talking to might sound crazy, but maybe they're not crazy because they're having a low blood sugar and the way that they're well, reacting. That's, exa that's exactly what I said about when people need to stop and talk to people when you right. see someone walking a little bit funny or they're looking a bit vacant or that people need to wake up. That to check in on people. And, and that's exactly what I mean. Like, you know, if I was talking to you and you were rambling on like that, I'd say, are you okay? Right. Uh, is there something are you okay? This right. is not, you know, this is not normal behavior. Right. And um, I totally understand where you'd be coming from because I see that sometimes Gabriel will get quite violent, quite angry. Yeah. That's and, another thing too that I think you know, people don't realize and, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's taller than me. Um, I'm five foot four, but he, he's a big guy. And if he's going to be like his brother, his brother's six foot two. So mm -hmm. he's quite, he's big as well. Um, you know, he plays rugby and he's, he's bigger than me. You know, he weighs more than me. He can, you know, he's, he's a big lad and, um, you know, it sometimes worries me, you know, I don't want to be in a situation where he gets angry and, you know, it's, um, and does something that he regrets. Um, so I think you have to be aware that those are those emotions that cannot be helped, um, but just need to be, try to be managed, yeah. um, better. But I also wonder too when it because I've that I had those thoughts as I've I had those senses as well too. But I always wonder like there's a there's a psychology behind it as well where the the, the lack of knowledge when someone acts violently like that, and uh, and then I've questioned myself: Am I really that bad of a person for behaving that way? Because you know it's like it's the I'm, people I said is kind of loosely where. Having low blood sugar, it's like you're drunk. And when you have the expression where people say, you know, when you're drunk, the true self comes out, whatever. I've I've wondered that, and and I've, and I've I've questioned myself, like if I behave that violently around my wife, which I know I would never do that to my wife, but you know, I'm swinging my arms, I'm cussing out, whatever it is, and I'm refusing to listen. Does that mean I'm really like that? 
you no. know, as a, no, 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 I, I, no, I know what you're saying, but like it, it's crossed my mm. mind. Mm. But the average person doesn't know that, and someone who's yeah. diabetic for the first time or never took care of themselves, and now they're finally taking that into into consideration. Like there's a whole psychology behind that as well too that they have to consider that mm. when I behave this way, I am not that person, but someone else that doesn't know me may think of me that way. And they, you know, let's say if I'm going for a job interview, they happen to be the one that interviews me. You see what I'm saying? They'll remember mm -hmm. that one time, but you're a diabetic. Yeah, but, you know, they're not going to know any better. And that's mm -hmm. like, there's so much behind that as well, too, that I'm not saying it's going to happen every time. I, I'm not implying that, but in that one chance, you know, mm -hmm. like I always think of that one chance if it happens, there's so much to consider as well, too, that I think that a lot of people don't understand and need to understand. Um mm -hmm. And 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 that's I think it's one reason why I'm I'm not so. I don't bring it up all the time, and I I've, I rarely bring it up in a conversation when it comes to people that I meet for the first time because it's not necessary. But it's there's there's still a, a I'm not gonna say insecurity, but maybe that's what it is. I think that's what it is actually when I think about it. That if I start to dip a little bit and and all of a sudden I'm, I'm not realizing it's my my sugar's low, which happens a lot, um, not on purpose of course, but. If the other person doesn't understand that, I have to explain to them, and I don't want to. That's that's mm -hmm. another part of me as well too that doesn't want to deal with it. Not because I don't have to, I don't want to confront, but I have to educate them. And do I really want to go through all that? And sometimes it's a it's an inner battle that I deal with. Not often, but when it does come up, it's the, it's the one beauty about the CGM monitor, though. Um, the sorry, the um continual glucose monitor, is that um the the Freestyle Libra is that. If you were talking to somebody, you can just tap your phone and you'd know exactly where you were because sure. they it doesn't only just have the blood sugar levels. It has three arrows. It will have an arrow going up, one going like straight ahead and one to the bottom. So say like you're 5.6, but you're feeling a bit, but it's going straight down because there's another one, sorry, straight down. Yeah, yeah. It means that you are going to be dropping quite, quickly considerably yeah 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 so maybe just take something yeah you know you just take a little gummy and then you're fine but yeah. i think when uh, the problem with what we had exactly like you were just saying with when we had to finger prick all the time he we couldn't really tell without doing a finger prick and when you're in the middle of something you can't just go oh hang on sorry i'm talking to you but hang on yeah. you know get your you know get your um bum bag out and start doing all of that sort of thing yeah. but literally now it's um just a, a tap oh right yeah okay right oh no i'm 5.6 and i'm a straight line that's fine i'm i'm good yeah and and move on you know yeah. it's like he just had a hypo i just checked it right it will give me an update to see where he is um if it's um come back up where it is oh, sorry and then and then it's uh yeah so it's into the green and he's 3.9 just going steady up so that's fine um it's it sort of goes like that. i don't know if you can see it but it's um i can see it from the screen there there's a little glare yeah. but i can still make out what, yeah. what's going on there so, so i get a graph so i can see every you know um where, where the levels are going up and down yeah up and yeah. down or you know where we want to be there there are benefits to that i i think the reason why i was so um resistant after i first tried yeah. it was just due to the fact that it just kept coming off and i was it yes. was, i was not getting the readings as consistent when it I mean, my readings i'm talking about like it's staying on me because it, it kept yeah. coming off and it, and it yeah, was such funny. a hassle and i didn't yeah. i was like well i'll just go back the old school way and yeah. it worked for me but the downside as you mentioned before is that i i can tell like i can feel it in my body i'm sure your son does as well too where you can tell if it's spiking up or if if I'm testing my sugar and it's like high, but I'm feeling a dip, like I can re I know the difference, but how far down is that dip gonna go? And exactly. that's the mystery, and that's the hardest yeah. thing to figure out. And the the benefits to that to the technology now is very beneficial when it comes to knowing where it's going up and down. And then I loved it, but I just had so much problem with just staying. Yeah, in, it's staying. Yeah, well, I'll definitely send you that that stuff and. Um, you know, just see if it, if it works. And and if you can't get it where you are, I'll send you some. And then you just tell me what it's like. If I you do, that. Get it. I do you, that. Um, do you have to, I was going to ask you actually about the, the healthcare over there. Sure. So do you have to buy that? Well, so it depends. So it's not like in the UK where everyone, you know, you have NHS and it's, yeah. um, 
so here in America, <clears throat> I'm not sure how how knowledgeable you are with the, with the the policy here, but so I get my my insurance through through my job, mm -hmm. and the 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 only caveat when it comes to insurance policies through your job is that every job is different, so it's not the same across the board. So right. you have policies that have that come in brackets. So you have a policy that may cover the most basic stuff. And then mm -hmm. if you want another policy that covers more, then you have to pay a little bit higher. So depending on the company you work with here, uh, it just depends. Some companies offer great insurance where they cover everything and you just pay whatever the fee is each month or each paycheck rather. Um, so without really getting too specifics here, but I'll, I'll put it this way. I pay the highest rate for my for my for my insurance policy with my company that I work at um and now I have to go see cuz I I have a really bad bad look on having to go to the doctor cuz I just hate going it's just something that I just don't like to do but I do do it but when I do it's like I'll do it when I need to that's the yeah. biggest that's one of my biggest bad habits that I've had yeah so now because I've been able to buy the tester literally off the counter it was yeah. so convenient for me that I can just go to the store. It saved me, you know, 10 bucks here and there, uh, 20 bucks if I want more strips or whatever else. It's been very convenient for me that way. So having to go to the doctor is just a yearly check. I mean, I have my I have my next coming up uh later this year in the, in the, in December, actually. So, you know, it's it's kind of more like I'll do it when I when I need it because I already have access to everything else over here. Yeah. Because it became a hassle going to the policy with the insurance policy where, okay, so if you have this, uh, we can cover this. So there's so many layers to that whole process that it, yeah. for as a diabetic for myself, it kind of kills the, you know, the the purpose of like going to the doctor and say, I want to get this and they'll get it and they have no problem with it, but will the insurance cover it? Okay, they will, but they're only going to cover this. And if they cover this, then you have to call. So it's, it's a very... Uh, it's, it's a lot of hurdles to go through. It's not like that every single time, but you do have to get permission every single time if you want to get something. If you want to get something, it has to be approved. I'm not sure if it's like that with the NHS over there, but I'm assuming it's a little more easier where you can just say, I want this. Okay, great. We'll get it for you. And then all you got to do is go to the, the pharmacy and it, you'll get it in and there. It's literally that easy, yeah. Yeah, it's not so much over here. It is yeah. easier now where I can just literally get a tester, the, 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 the meter, on this yep. at the store 10 years ago it was not like that at all you literally have to get it all through the insurance and and if you want to pay for it it's, it was a lot if you want to pay out of pocket mm -hmm. now it's so accessible that it's like almost as if you don't need a doctor but yep. unless you have to go so, to see one so i think that's one of the reasons why i i stuck with this because it was so much easier mm -hmm. as opposed to going through the insurance policy to get the reader yeah it's a shame they make it difficult for you though um well it, it is, but like I said, it, it's it's really depending on the person because if 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 I really look at the end of the day, for me, it's all about if you really want to take care of it, you'll do whatever is necessary. And I found the way that works for me, and it's I'm going to say it's easier because it was it was because it was easy to get the 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 tools that I need, and because I'm taking care of myself, it's like yeah. I don't need to go through all that trouble. When I go work out, I have everything that I need. If I if I feel like I'm dropping. Right away, I'm just get a cube of gummy uh, that I get from whatever else, and I'm eating, and then I wait a couple minutes, and if it's coming back up, I continue. If I know I'm going to be another hour in the gym and it's still low, I'll get two cubes. If I have to go three, I'll go three cubes, and then I'll go and check it. Okay, well, it was way too much. Okay, I'll just I'll know how much I'm going to inject myself because I'm not going to eat afterwards, and mm -hmm. then I stay up an extra maybe thirty minutes just to see if it's still dwindling down. And if it's not, then I know I can go to bed. But then even then, I still take that safe measure of, let me just take one cube just to be on the mm -hmm. safe side because mm -hmm. it does drop. And I'm sure your son that goes through this because I, I think he may take uh, long-lasting long, long insulin at night. before. Yeah, so the basal right? line, yeah. So he takes, I take, I take. Uh, he takes, um, he takes Traceba. Yeah, well, I take Basilgar. Right. Uh, okay. I'm not sure how many put, immunes he puts on, but I think I put, I, I, well, I, I say I think, but I know, but because I, 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 I kind of uh, range it out. So 10 to 15 units a night. He has 20. Yeah. 20. Well, I put less because I do so much at night because most of my workouts yeah. take place at night. So yeah. I know I'm going to keep burning. So that's yeah. why I take that one extra cube at night. Yeah, I think because you stop growing, because he's growing, um, they can go up to 40 when they're growing. Right. 
So yeah. it's a lot because the the testosterone and stuff that um get kick gets kicked in. So um at the minute he's on twenty, but they said to me it will probably double by the time yeah. he's fifteen. Yeah. So like I I found what works for me, and it's been pretty good for the most part. I would say um it, it does take it does I, I take a lot from the doctors that I I go to to get perspective that I may not see that they can obviously see for me as well. So getting that second opinion does help out a great deal, but I think because I'm becoming, I, I'm I'm realizing that for myself, and which is why I was asking before about your son doing it for himself and whatnot. Um, I I maybe it's the, wrong, it's, just, it's the wrong way of looking at it, but I look at it from perspective. If I don't have anyone to help me, who can I turn to but to myself? So I have to be very dependent on me being able to know that if my wife's not going to be tonight, I have to be prepared for every single possibility of what could happen. So I, I, I'm very meticulous when it comes to that sort of stuff, but it wasn't like that before. So I'm still figuring out what that, pro that I think, I think that the, the one sort of beauty about it is if you have one of those um, monitors is that it gives you just that little bit of freedom, just for one night, you can mm -hmm. lie in and your wife will check the phone and go, Oh, he's a little bit low. I'm going to just right. wake him up. Do you know well, what I mean? Just yeah, for I you. Because it's a lot of pressure for you. You're like, I've got to write, make this, sure this, and then I've got to do that. If I'm on my own, I've got to make sure I've got everything in place. It's a, it's, that's a lot of pressure. Well, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying by pressure. I, I don't, it's, it's funny because I don't look at it as pressure. Not not because the, the, the reason why I say it is because I'm living with it. So yeah. I have to make, I have to but make. It's a lot uh, of responsibility, I it think. It is a responsibility for sure. I, 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 and I know what you're saying by that, but. Like I'll put it this way: I've I spent many nights without my wife in the room uh, yeah. with me before, so and that ha has taught me a lot about myself, about you know the responsibility that I have to take on for preparing for that stuff. Um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, um, at least I know I got the routine down to a point. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I it, it's, it, if you come to my if you're in my because I'm in my room. If you look at my my side of the bed, it looks like a, a counter for like a grocery store. Like I have. I have juices there. I have yes. candy. Yeah, yeah. I have everything that I need yeah. because if in the event if I'm waking up and I'm knocking things down, I can still grab something. So I, I've literally have it prepared to the point where I have, there should be no excuse why oh, yeah. I shouldn't have access to that stuff. So I'd rather overstock than understock. And so, yeah. you know, I overcompensate. Yeah, and it's a lot how I converse as well too. But it's a, in a lot of ways, it, it's very beneficial for me to be overprepared and have all that stuff right next to me. I have my meter. I have everything next to me. My 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 insulin, yeah. uh, my logs, all that's right there. So I can tell myself, you have no excuse for messing up. And if you do mess up, then you have no excuse for why you should not have everything else prepared. So I, it's literally over planning, over planning, over planning. And it, it, it got to the point where I literally go to the bathroom because my bathroom is right there. If I'm getting up to go to the bathroom, I have something right there prepared just to be in the safe side. Is yeah. it necessary? No, but it's it's one of those things that has helped me. And it got to the point where I realized, okay, so I'm doing way too much. What can I scale back on? So yeah. it's the trial yeah. error process for me as well, too, that I, I figured out what works and what doesn't work. And that's how I got to the point where it's I, I look back at myself now when I think about all the things I could have done. And you know, it is what it is now, but yeah. it's like I don't want to go back to that. And I've gotten so far to this point right now. I mean, I'm 39 right now. Um, I I don't know. I've heard stories that insulin can, like, I guess, take away more. I, I don't know if it's true or not. But I want to be to the point where I I can, I've got down a patent system for myself that when I'm 80 or when I'm live to a 90, whatever it is, where I can, I don't, I'm not falling apart when I'm trying to do what I'm doing now at 39. So yeah. I'm I'm at a point with myself that, I figured out what's got to work for me and what's going to work for me and what's not going to work for me. I can figure it out right then and there and skip over that and move on to the next step. So mm -hmm. it's all about self-sufficiency, but I'm also very dependent on other people to help me in the process as well too. But if mm -hmm. they can't, I can't, I'm not going to bitch and moan and go, Oh my God, what? No, it's, I've, yeah. I'm moving past all that stuff as well too, which is why I, I was, when you mentioned about the documentary, I think the thing I'm more concerned about with people understanding the is is this the self pity side of it as well too. I'm not saying your sense like that. I'm not, I'm yeah. not implying that, but it's there. I've seen a lot of that with other diabetics, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, guys, get over it. It's we can live with it. We just got to make do with yeah. it and deal with it. And I'm not 
saying that I don't believe in support systems. I do, but I'm not the, the type of person to go like, let's go to Dag Better Grip and find out like, what can we help you to know. Just yeah, no, 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 yeah, so, yeah. That's that's my position. I understand, that well. Totally understand with that. So. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's always funny. I think the one of a funny diabetic story was when I was going through um, airport security. And they said, have you got anything sharp with you? And I said, oh, yes, lots yeah. and lots of sharp, sharp things. And they kind of look with this horror going, Ugh. I'm going, yeah, no, so here's the letter. It's but. it's funny, though, because diabetes, I think for, for a lot of people that aren't aware of it, is not as, I mean, it is, but it's not as difficult as they think it, it, it is. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest hurdles for, for any diabetic is just really just the eating, knowing what you want to eat, how you want to eat it and just be responsible with the consequences they're going to come with the said, you know, food you want to eat. I said, never um, eat pizza. <laughs> uh, I've had pizza yeah, that's recently. One, that's one thing that's like, it's, oh, that's awful. That pizza. Oh my goodness. You know, I do indulge. I'm not going to say I don't, I do indulge, but I'm fully aware of the consequences. So I've, I've gotten better to the point where I can scale back on the amount of indulging that I would do. Um, and oddly enough, I don't miss a lot of what I do. I, I will say though, I do miss eating a lot of French fries. I yeah, or chips in this case for yourself. But it's yeah. like it's I, I miss that so much that yeah. if I smell it, I probably would cave in, but not as yeah. much as I used to. So yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's different as well. I mean, like I heard you said you were injecting, yeah, and Gabriel injects as well, and we have an yeah. argument with the doctor every time we go, every three months with a check up because oh he needs to be on a pump he has to go on a pump 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 we tried the pump he doesn't like it I and like it I said, well, he doesn't like it yeah. you know um he doesn't want to be attached to something and then put another bag with a cannula coming out and then another, you know he says mom no one knows i've got it i do it when you know he he injects so secretly that you would never know that he had it i did it and, when i was talking to jonathan uh, in their last conversation yeah. i don't think he even noticed it at all <laughs> so. yeah it's it's just so easy. You just do it, and it's not exactly. You know what to do, um, and and when to do it. And um, he said, "I don't, I don't want to be attached to anything. That's it. I'm not. I'm. I can do it, and and that's fine. And that's his choice. And we sort of battle with them every three months. Oh, you know, if anyone's diagnosed with type one now in England, they're put straight on a pump. There's no offer of injections. Mm. So that's how England is." Um, so any child now that is, um, diagnosed with diabetes from now, like it's, it's, they're only on a pump. So he's really, he's really old school on an injection. So they're like, please, you know, you really need to come to the, you know, the pump, the pump clinic, the pump clinic, the pump. And I'm like, no, we're not coming on the pump clinic. He doesn't want it. I cannot force him. I'm not going to force him. I said, look, when he's 18 and 20, what if he changes his mind? At any point in his life, go for it. Why but is a pump such a big thing in England about being being like the 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 the, the go to uh, for diabetics? Like, why is the because doctor the, because, on that? Because the control on the HbA one C level is pretty damn good with it. Mm. It can get it into the forties very easily, whereas you know we're, we're not. So um, the control is better because. It constantly, it kind of acts like a pancreas because it feeds in the insulin when your body needs it. So if it sees you going up a bit, it will release it. Right. Um, it will trigger you to say, we need a, a 0.5. So you press yes and then on your phone and it will give you a little bit. And you don't inject, you don't do anything. But it's, it's only a certain amount that's, that's three attached days. to you. I think it's every three days you, you change it. So how many how many ounces are in the uh, vial for it to? Because I mean, you have like the pen. Because I use the pen right now, and it's got like I don't know, depending which one you 100, get. Hundred, yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. Pills, yeah. I think it's it's about fifty to a hundred, a hundred probably a hundred. Really? Yeah, have it it's, a, like that? it's it's about this big. Um, ah, you okay. It, you can have it on your. See, the only thing is, you know, look, Gabriel doesn't like it. I asked him why. Um, and I said, you know, why don't we try it? And the thing is, it's got to be very near to the monitor because they have to speak to one uh, another. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you've got your arm full of stuff. Then you've got, you know, another device that people have on a on a like a. Sorry, do you call it a fanny pack? Yes, fanny yeah, pack. Yeah, fanny pack. Yeah, we call it a bum bag. Sorry. Yeah, I, I figured that's what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and um you know all of a sudden you you strapped up to all the and, and I get it you know you want to go swimming no one will know you want to go and do whatever you want to do no one will know but when you've got all of these things yeah, on you looking like I, a I cyborg by that point yeah <laughs> That's very And, you know, changing it every three days, you know, with the glucose monitor, it's every two weeks. That's doable. You know, it's just yeah. easy. Um, whereas, you know, it's just complicating things that he, he well, I I said to him to get the HbA1 C level better, it would be beneficial. Yeah. He doesn't want to. His choice. True. The end. <laughs> That's very, very interesting how that, the, the, the uh, how the system over there is working, how they're implying, how they're insisting on that. It's very, very interesting here uh, to hear that. I mean, to say, mm -hmm. do you, do you think though, in time, uh, with regards to England for your, uh, given your experience over there, do you think that it, it, everyone will catch up to be much more knowledgeable and more empathetic, respectful towards type one diabetes, as far as like the general consensus concern with people being knowledgeable enough to understand that, if there's some something going off with one person that you know let's 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 approach them respectfully say, hey are you okay you know they, do you think we'll get to that or you think you guys will get to that point over there when I, it comes I to that so. yeah i do i think so i think if people would embrace that as well as they have done pronouns and having to respect everybody's all always he she them whatever mm -hmm. and i think if we can change like that i think there are other ways people can change too that are you know can save you, lives help but do you think that it'll it'll be in a sense because like the reason i'm asking this now because i mentioned about the, the pronoun aspect of it where there's a there's a bit of an aggressiveness behind you know you got to do it like this but do you think in with going through that phase if you will and understanding the the process and understanding the 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 situation for various diabetic, diabetic uh type 1 diabetics i should say do you think that that aggressiveness that in this case the pronouns aspect of people having to understand and respect that do you think that in time with the various other things that will be coming down the pipeline with people understanding type 1 diabetes uh, schizophrenia the various other uh, things that people are not as knowledgeable when it comes to that do you think that there will be a much more calmer approach to that where taking the time to understand it, taking the time to learn about it. Like, do you think that will also be part of the process as well too? I, I do think so. Yeah, I really yeah. do. Because I think food is such a big topic at the minute. Right. It's everyone's talking about food. Everyone's talking about carbohydrates and fasting and intermittent fasting and all different things are being talked about. Um, so I think that it all plays well together because, um, you know, we are talking about, carbohydrates and counting carbohydrates and um it is all about food you know the bottom line is it is about food it's um it's like a food in almost it's not a food intolerance but you know what i mean it's like yeah, that yeah. sort of it's you know if you know you know type thing yeah. um and it it can be it can be as easy as just getting the diet right you know i think if you can get the groove on with the diet, I think the body will follow. And that's regardless of diabetes, that's obesity, it's type two, it's it's like so many different um, things that, it, you know, diet helps with. Um, yeah. Celiac, um, you know, IBS, all different things, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just personally with me, um, I sort of a bit of lactose intolerance i don't have cow's milk but i have almond milk um that's just what i do with my right. diet you know and i think that it's very um you can be very specific as specific as you want to be with the diabetes um to, to get it really in tune you can be really in tune with it you can really master it and be bloody brilliant at it you know you can really embrace it and really go with this. And, you know, the best athletes that I have seen, swimmers, rugby players, there's a rugby player who um, is in the England team, have type one. You know, which, I've which always. player has, the, has type um, one? I, I, I can't, don't, don't put me on the spot with names. <laughs> I'm so bad. But, um, but yeah, there, there were a couple that I reached out to them actually when um, Gabriel first was um, in interested in rugby right. and i actually reached out to them and asked them about their regime and he told me um 
actually this is an Olympic swimmer, the one I'm talking about, okay. um, because it was a, he was swimming as well. And I asked him, I said, look, um, my son keeps going low. I, I reached out and I was got rejected, rejected. But then he, he asked me back and I said, listen, my, my son, he's nine. He's got type one. He swims. He always goes hypo in the water. And there last week he was kind of, I saw him flailing like he was drowning. Yeah, yeah. You know, no one else had noticed this, by the way. But I sit there like, you know, watching like this every sport that he did when he was young, mm. because I always thought of that moment, which actually happened. And um, he, I dragged him out and he was sort of like all over the place and I yeah. gave him his glucose and he perked up and he was 2.3, pretty low. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to ask and I, I asked this Olympic guy who is a swimmer and um, he said, make sure you give him loads of, um, you, you give him the um, something sugary before he right. goes in but follow it up with lots of protein. And I said, oh, okay. He said- it's Because the, the protein slowly builds up the, the sugar. Into yes, the, yeah, and it, yeah, it yeah. elongates that sugar. So yeah. instead of saying, right, just have a quick, you know, high energy snack before you go in the yeah. pool, which I was doing, yeah, like yeah. quick have a banana. Yeah. It wasn't working. And I couldn't work out why it wasn't working. And I was thinking, well, God, you know, he's 16 before he goes in the pool. Why is he now 2.3? How is that possible? Um, so, um, and I was doing that. So I just cut up, you know, and make sort of like fun little chicken. I'd make my own like sort of chicken nuggets, put a tiny bit of, you know, niceness around it, you know, to so it's not just a raw chicken, you know, like a sort of <laughs> boiled chicken. I know what you're saying, yeah. Real <laughs> chicken, but you know what I mean. Spruce kind it up, make, yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, a bit of sriracha, a bit of, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of zhuzh it up a bit. And, um, and it really did work. And I, I was, uh, you know, things like that. And, and now the cold pasta, you know, the cold pasta, cold, um, you know, re-frozen re bread that you um, reheat uh, or make into sandwiches once it's frozen. And then by the time it thaws out, it's ready to eat. So it's like bread, like a sandwich. Mm. Those things um, have really changed his life with things like that. Interesting. So I think, um, I think when I look at, Sorry, I was I, I digress, but I was trying to get to the point where the sports people who have got type one, their diet is fantastic. Right. Yeah. They have it under control and they are brilliant sportsmen. And you know, type one diabetics, they say make really good sports people because they know exactly what their blood sugar levels are most of the time. Yeah. So they know, you know, like bodybuilders who were type one diabetic. I, I used to follow so many. Um, athletes with type one. I, I cut it all down because I was just getting so you know, <laughs> overwhelmed. That was, yeah, that was my life. My timeline was looking of, uh, pretty bad. So, <laughs> so I thought, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, um, but I, I did it for years, you know, just looking and looking and seeing how they're so good. Why are they they're so strong? And right. they are. They're, they're really, really strong because their diet's bloody brilliant. Yeah. You know, there's a lot that they have to that we have to consider too when it comes to. Because I think one of the things that, because I, I, there was one guy that I do follow who's type one diabetic, and I, I, there's a lot that I've listened to that I really agree with too. But someone had asked him because he's he has a great physique as well. They had asked him, "Do you take any sort of like you know steroids, TRT, things of that nature?" And he's like, "No, 100 percent natural." And I think one of the reasons why I was so impressed with the with him was because the fact that there was a lot of work that he had to put into you know his dieting and everything else. And I think a lot of people tend to forget that. With a lot of hard work, you can get good results. But for type one diabetics, and specifically, it's a lot more—I want to say hard, but a lot more different because there's a lot of things we have to factor in. Yes. Uh, which then, in turn, the results kind of showcase, you know, the the hard work as well. And I think, I think they're looking at the results more so than the than the actual process in itself. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting you point out about rugby with your son because when you said because uh, I. I I think a lot of people don't realize, but uh, rugby is a sport that I'm I'm really getting into more and more lately, particularly with Europe, uh, because there is there's something about the sport that really speaks to me. But when you, as soon as you said uh, England, uh, uh, an a, a, a British uh, player mm. for the, the national mm. team, I'm wondering who you're talking about here because I don't follow a lot of them. There's quite a few that I do, and I'm wondering if one of the athletes you're talking about is one of the ones that is type one diabetics because. 
I'll send rugby. you his name. <laughs> well, I send you the things. Well, I'm, I'm sure I'll find because I'll, I'll look to the roster and I'm, and I'm, I'm yep. going to do my digging as well. But I'm, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can send any information. I help me out a great deal to speed it up. But, but the reason I'm pointing out with rugby specifically is because that is one of the hardest sports out there that I don't mm -hmm. think a lot of people realize who are not familiar with the sport. Mm -hmm. And it's very demanding physically, party wise, yes. among other things as well. It's basically it's everything you can look for yeah, strength brutal, and yeah. speed yeah. in one sport. That's, that's where I always refer to. But, um, with your son though, um, him playing rugby, do you think it, it has he mentioned before that it, it's helped him fine tune certain things about how he's going about his day to day routine that he parlays into this, that he goes elsewhere with it as well too, with his diabetes? Is, did you notice a big difference with him because of the sport? Um, I do actually, because he will, you have to be fit to play it. Right. You know, you have to be fit to play it. You can't build muscle if you have too much glucose in your blood. It's right. not going to work. Right. You can't build muscle with yeah. high blood sugar levels. That's impossible. Yeah. So if you want to build your muscle, you have to get your diet right. right. Um, and with high glucose, you break your limbs easier. Yeah. So you will get injuries a lot quicker you'll get um you know you'll be injured so if you want to be a bad rugby player you have bad diabetes with it if you want to be a good rugby player and you want to be better you need to control your blood sugar levels more and you need to eat better so i think it's it's a turnaround because if you're doing something that you love and the only thing that impacts what you're doing is what you eat it's not as hard i mean i know it, it don't get me wrong it is harder yeah. as you know to, yeah. to control the diet blah 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 and, and and yes it is yeah i i get it um i do um but you have to get those the numbers down for your hba1 level um hba1c levels down in order to get your muscle get your injury levels down get your yeah. and and it's just ticking it over that, okay, that's what you need to do. I mean, I've always said to Gabriel, um, you know, when when you have those meltdowns of why me, why is it me? It's not fair, it's not fair. I just think, look, you can walk down the road, nobody knows what you've got. You don't, you know, what about, you know, these poor children who can't walk? What about poor children who are in a wheelchair, who have to have a feeding tube, who there's – Whatever you go through, there's a million people who are worse off than yourself. You're lucky. You're lucky that you can do something about it. Yeah. You know, there are people with Crohn's disease who have to have surgeries and live in constant pain. That you know, they 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 have to have part of bowels removed and have things bags attached to them. And I mean, for God's sake, that's a million times worse. Yeah. You know, and people, you have to just embrace whatever and i know it's hard and it's easy for me to say that because it's not me um and that's why i hate saying things like that oh you see, come on do this it's easy and it's not well, easy but there but there is truth to that as well too because my mom said the same thing as well too so was my wife and i used to get angry at that as well um which is something that i think a lot of diabetics go through where they have when people tell the the the, the, the most obvious things yeah and they take it you know almost as an insult but but there's truth to that because there's a lot of things that I, I've have taken for granted with my health included, where I just think I said before, I gained a lot of weight and a lot of weight. And then having to lose the weight in the process as well, too, was something that made me realize about the the damage I was doing to myself. And, you know, if it wasn't for my wife, because uh, I, I I didn't share this so publicly, but I, I had a conversation here in this room with my wife one night. It was literally about almost three years ago this actually three years next month, believe it or not, where we had a long conversation about something and my health was one of the things that came up and that conversation, I swear it changed everything about me. And this is not a conversation we haven't had before. We've had this, but for some reason, that particular one, it was one of those things where my wife had made a decision for herself where she was working out all the time and, and, st and still does to this day. And I was seeing the results that she was, that she was getting. And then I will, I'll never forget when she was telling me how, she wanted to try some new things. And those new things that she wanted to try sparked my interest, but then they became more about 
personal uh, things as well, too, for myself, where I was like, yeah, I can't do what I'm doing right now to achieve those things that she wants to achieve that I want to achieve as well, too. And that conversation literally changed. And I remember it was one of those things where I'll, from this day forward, I'll never go back to this again. And has and has, I've never gone back since then. And I'm so glad that we had that conversation that night because if we hadn't had it, I don't think I'd be in this position that I'm in right now. I, I mean, there's literal videos of me in doing interviews and reviews and whatever else where I was severely obese. You can see from my face, I'm just rounded and everything else. And I'm not saying I cringe when I look back at it, but I look back at it and I think, you know, how how differently I thought at that time and how mm -hmm. in, how very irresponsible I was. Mm -hmm. And it's a good reminder that I'm looking at that with like, so now you're not going back to that again. So from this day forward, stick with what you're doing. And I haven't looked back since. If it wasn't for that conversation with my wife that she had sparked and, and, and started for me. So I said it a million times, my wife has changed a lot for me. And that was one of those instances where she has done that for me as well. And um, I'm glad she has because if she hadn't done that, I have no idea where I would have been. I probably would have never, I probably wouldn't be in this position right now talking to you, to be honest with you. I don't think I would ever had the courage to even tell you, uh, hey, I'm type one and, uh, you know, message yeah. or whatever else. So there's a lot that has changed because of that conversation. And so I'm grateful for that. And here we are now. So it's interesting how things have turned out. Yeah, well, she must be a very wonderful woman because, um, you know, that it's a, you have to have a very, very good partner. You must yeah, I, have yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um, and I mean, I can see, yeah. That's the I one mean, thing I pray for with Gabriel, that he gets somebody hopefully as good as your wife. <laughs> it's 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 funny because, you know, uh, I'm, I don't mind sharing this here, but my, my dad said something when I was first diagnosed. I'll never forget this moment. And this is one of those things where I remember, you know, when you talk about empathy and the lack of education, this is one of those situations where I remember distinctly uh, catching myself and realizing that um, this is what I'm going to have to deal with here. My dad just said something to me along, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in the hospital bed um, after I was diagnosed. And he had said to me, um, you know, it's going to be really hard for you moving forward because now you're going to find people that are not going to want to, maybe not want to be, they're not going to be comfortable around you and et cetera, et cetera. I'll never forget the moment where I, where I, I, when he said that, I was like, no, that's bullshit because if someone likes me for who I am, they're going to accept my you know, me having diabetes. And if they're not going to be around me because of that, then fuck them. This is what I told myself. Yeah, exactly. And I had said that to him, not, not in those exact words, but I said that to him. I was like, yeah, you know, that's, I'm not concerned about that because I know what I'm going to do to fix. Now, granted, I've made a lot of bad choices, but I do remember distinctly telling myself and telling him that I am not going to let someone uh, put me down just because of this. I've got better things to worry about than this fucking nonsense. So I was like, I, and I remember distinctly telling myself that, and I've always had that in me, you know, granted the lack of responsibilities that I had not taken up at that point. But it was one of those things where I remember I that was never going to be an issue for me at all moving forward. So I'm glad I had that. And I remember, I don't even know where I got that from too, but that's something that never crossed my mind to to consider. So Yeah. Well, that that's that you're lucky. Um, I think that, you know, any anything like that and with people leave your side because of something like that it's it's probably best that they do if my wife left me don't because need, of you it, don't need people like that near you right well i mean but if my wife had left me because of me not taking care of, i wouldn't have mm. blamed her N now yeah. i'm saying yeah. but you know but it's that was because of me mm -hmm. uh because of my irresponsibility but yeah it's but again it's it, i think it really just depends on how you know the person uh, handles it at the end of the day but you know, that's just me though i was you know, this is a conversation that I've been wanting to have for you for quite some time, and I'm glad yeah. we're finally having it here. Yeah. Um, but I will be honest. So I'm I'm glad we didn't have it the first time. Uh, however far back it was when we were doing this, because I don't know, I don't know if I was uh, if I was as prepared as I thought I was as I am now to talk with you about this year. Because um, the one thing I did want to talk about with you is the, the is diabetes, because I really wanted to get your perspective on how you felt about the various things that you've seen with your son for yourself and and very so we come across here because um it's not that i said not that i'm saying that i never wanted to talk about it. it's just it was just never something I, I it came to thought to talk about but considering that the opportunities that were there uh to present for a conversation to take place here i'm mm -hmm. glad they came about very organically in this particular case this is a situation where i felt it was a very natural thing for me to to get mm -hmm. into with you um because you've had that experience and you still are having that experience as yeah. well. 
So this meant a lot for me personally uh, to have yeah, that conversation. Too. I'm, me glad, too. I'm glad. No, really, me too. And and the fact that you said you're there, you want to do a documentary to to do to do to talk about this here. I'm very happy that you said that because uh, uh, it's one thing to hear from someone who's going through the experience, but to hear from, in a weird way, kind of the outsider perspective, where you have, you know, you're looking at from both both sides of the uh, of the spectrums, if you will, because I think that perspective is very important too. Um, well, we can definitely collaborate with that one. Um, I will definitely keep you in the loop and see what we can do because I would it would love be, to be a part of that as well. It, no, it, it would be lovely because it would get um, sort of across the water as well. Yeah, um, and get different perspectives, you know, different different people. I mean, I mean, it would be really nice if it was sort of people in the business. So that would be really nice because it, it, I, it is, yeah. But but I think what what's interesting though is like we there the pers to me perspective is very important, and you know there's there's someone that has to start off that perspective, and I think it's it's great to uh, I'm going to say it like this. I, I think it's great to start off from a parent's perspective because. Especially a parent such as who's deeply involved and very invested, that to me is a very, uh, very important, uh, very important point of view to get, because if you hear from, I'm uh, not to say like uh, in a bad way, but you know, if if I'm doing it for myself, there's a there's a slight bias behind it. Mm -hmm. I think that can I'm not gonna say it'd be jaded, but if you have more or less like a maternal figure such as yourself but you're in the trenches with your son and mm -hmm. you understand the history you had because you talked about your friend who you who had passed away at 32 but you knew about that before then mm -hmm. there is that perspective as well too so there's a lot of preparation leading up to that as well mm -hmm. something about that i think speaks volumes that if you get that from the starting point you may have something to lead off here that hopefully that will change the perspective of everyone else who has no knowledge or probably didn't care and hopefully will care after the fact as well too. So I think, you know, from you doing it from your standpoint is very, very important. And um, in any way that I can contribute, I certainly would love to help out. But, you know, I think from you, from your perspective, I think that's extremely important. I hope that that will hopefully be a gateway for a lot of people to kind of take notice of that and hopefully you know go further with that as well too so mm -hmm. i got to give you props for that but i i believe that there's something you can do with it that can really be a great change for hopefully everybody moving forward from there so yes yeah uh, let's hope thank you well i guess so for the camera though as i said before we're, since we're closing off here yeah. uh, i'm not sure if there's anything else you want to add on to this here to close off but i really did appreciate this conversation i'm looking at I, i'm hoping we can get more out of this as well too yeah. Uh, especially have the releases with these upcoming projects here, Halloween, yes. uh, Peter Rabbit, Nightfall, and various other ones as well, too. But um, is there anything else you want to say in closing, too, to kind of uh, close off here for everyone out here? No. Um, just <laughs> if you are on Instagram, um, please, or Twitter, please follow Shogun Films. Um, we'll have everything that, you know, we're doing thing on there and um, we're trying to just get some more followers on there um it's really hard now social media geez um yeah, it's a pain in the i head. don't I understand it i'm so technically in that but you know it's <laughs> if you can all follow and um just be supportive and um we're going to make some really good movies this year and just um please download legally um mm. and uh, because that's killing us it's killing everybody in this mm. business but um all these you know things but anyway if you can do that that would be much appreciated and it was really lovely talking to you rob i mean i've talked to you many a time before mm. not on screen right. but um we've had some nice conversations and i've really appreciated you having me and talking about the thing so thank you so much no the honor was mine so if anything thank you very much for that and i really mean that for, with with the utmost sincerity as well too so i i can't thank you enough for giving me the time and, and the opportunity to speak with someone uh, about this as well too with di diabetes and obviously we were your projects as well too but this meant a lot for me and i'm, and I'm looking forward to uh see what the future holds uh, moving forward with you and jonathan and and so showguns and everyone else involved with the projects here so for the cameras i want to say thank you and cheers to you as well thanks so much rob thank you night night night